very warm well welcome to everyone from uh, myself. I'm a Professor Patrick Kostkova. I'm the director of the UCL Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies, celebrating its third anniversary today. It's not exactly today, but we round it up a little bit. Today is a special day because we also have an annual project meeting with our MIBAR project celebrating uh, our achievements in Brazil and also in Portugal. So you will see a number of international speakers who, are, who all have come face to face in person to London to share achievements with this special project looking at mosquito surveillance in a tropical part of Brazil. And we will have a half a day of uh, showcasing achievements from this project. Also, another digital interventions we've been developing in DPHE over the last three years, especially our COVID uh, interventions. And also, the highlight of the day will be a strategic panel starting at 6 p.m. in the evening with uh, five panelists uh, discussing where are we with One Health? How can we improve the surveillance of the animal and the human diseases to limit spillovers and emergence of new pathogens? And how we can prepare better for the next pandemics? So I'm so glad to see all of you here, even though it's a sunny day in London. It's great to be indoors and enjoying a face-to-face -face event. We have coffee breaks with real coffee. No Zoom break, and we have a catering and reception in the evening after the panel. So you are more, more than welcome to stay and enjoy some networking and discussions with the speakers, the panelists, and obviously uh, among yourself. So I just give a very brief talk to summarize what the DPHE Center has achieved. Uh, those of you who are interested in the details can pick up uh, this, this report, which has been just printed. It's outside. and. Uh, if you're not interested in detail, you can just listen to me over the 10 minutes to see what achievements we have done and uh, where are we going as a digital public health center in emergencies. So the vision for the center established three years ago was to use innovation. Some of you know I'm a computer scientist by background. However, the vision has been to bring together public health, emergencies, and computer science together as an interdisciplinary field, digital public health, where there has been a major, major gap. So looking at the cutting edge innovations and strengthening the global capacity and preparedness. So as if we knew three years ago that there would be uh, pandemics and the capacity and preparedness wasn't quite in place as we have all seen during COVID-19 and in response to public health emergencies. And the center is of course conducting research. So I will give you highlights of our research projects. We are teaching, we're teaching our students to inspire the next generation in public, public health and innovation. We're organizing a number of events, a conference, and also engaging with the community. We work globally. So this map is really showcasing where DPHE has got collaborations and where we have a variety of our projects. So literally, ex except Antarctica, I think we work on every continent. The idea was to look at how emergencies, and our speciality is health emergencies, but actually they could be non-health emergency. They could be, uh, they could be natural disasters and earthquakes and tsunamis and, uh, and urban emergency crashes, for example, mass events like Olympics. They all create um, an opportunity which is, has got massive health risks. So how do technological uh, opportunities, mobile phones, mobile apps, sensing uh, IoT devices, how social media, how all this can strengthen our opportunity to understand what's going on and how we can respond to those emergencies has been, has been the kind of cornerstone of the central activities. So what have we achieved uh, in the last three years? Well, I'm so proud that the center received uh, the first prize. It was the winner um, of the best team of the year 2020 by Computing Rising Star Awards 2020. Unfortunately, the ceremony was online, so we couldn't even have a good party. We just watched it, watched it on Zoom, but we were awarded that this was kind of the top screen showcasing that we have given an impression that the team is enjoying and takes pride in what it does. I think we do take pride what, have, what we have achieved. 
In addition to being the team of the year 2020, uh, myself and my colleagues have also achieved a number of prizes. I won the Innovator of the Year for our Gazda initiative in Nigeria and also for our uh, journaling app in 2020. And colleagues of mine, Georgiana and Caroline, have also been successful. So it's, it's really great to see that the Centre isn't just an academic institution, but is valued and appreciated by industry awards and industry prizes. As I said, we just all we're also organizing uh, events. So I established a digital public health conference in 2009, and it's been running for 10 years. We have to give it a break over COVID because I don't believe in Zoom conferences. I think it is about networking and meeting people and spinning new ideas over a coffee break. So the conference will be resumed now we are coming out of the pandemics. I'm also chairing um, a chair of a Frontiers Digital Public Health Journal. So those of you who are thinking of a venue where you could publish your interdisciplinary research in this field, you don't have to go any further. We've been fortunate to have a high media coverage for our innovations and our research. Also during the pandemics, um, I was awarded a Corona Persona by Science uh, Business um, Journal, and we've been quite highly covered recently, um, just a couple of months ago, when I was uh, visiting our colleagues in Funchal. We were on the local news uh, for the World Health Day. Um, I was speaking as a keynote speaker. So the centre has got some achievements, and I'm really grateful to all the team members who contributed to those prizes. So a quick overview of the, um, the themes and the research topics we are working on. Um, so if you're interested, you can look through the report to see more details about these projects. So as I mentioned, we, do, we work a lot with our social media. So in the first pandemics, or the previous pandemics, not first, 2009, we've been one of the first team looking at analyzing social media and Twitter to find how social media could be used as an early warning system. And we have predicted um, the swine flu about two to three weeks before the official surveillance data at the HPA, Health Protection Agency in the UK, and CDC in the US would have known. As I mentioned, we also extensively work in Brazil uh, on participatory surveillance systems uh, in northeast Brazil, and you will learn a lot about these projects throughout the afternoon. It, it uh, includes IoT devices sensing, it also includes the mobile app, and also looking at how we can strengthen the surveillance systems uh, in, in this fantastic country. And also we have got a spin-off project in Portugal, in Madeira, and we will also discuss later on how our Portuguese colleagues are doing uh, IoT-based sensing. Our third team is looking at how do we combine all the data and how we actually develop some kind of dashboard systems which will be used for early warning and response. So our MediPass board project is illustrating how zoonotic data, surveillance data and data from social media could be all brought together in a single dashboard to strengthen the decision making of public health experts in the field. We also look for social media, not just for uh, pr predicting pandemics, but also understanding how social media is being used and misused for misinformation or purposefully, uh, purposefully created fake news. We have a specific look at understanding how um, anti-vaccinations lobbies are using social media, Twitter in particular, to create fake news and how is this being spread through the, um, through the network and who are the main players who are actually propagating and disseminating the fake news further. We've done a lot of work in antibiotic prescribing and antibiotic resistance. As you know, antibiotic resistance is one of the global problems, perhaps as important for us to solve as humankind as global warming. We have worked in this massive field in two different settings. We developed um, a training app for surgeons in Nigeria, and now we are uh, piloting it also in the UK to strengthen prescribing at the point of care and improve compliance with WHO guidelines. And this is our fantastic team in Nigeria winning one of the prizes. And we demonstrated a behavior change. We really could say that the app being used as a decision support tool at the point of care advised the um, surgeon if the decision he or she was making was not in compliance to reconsider the prescription uh, decision and give an opportunity to record a change. This, this app has also got some gamification features to keep people engaged in the project. And I look forward how this is going to be uh, deployed in the NHS. The second project in the field of antibiotic prescribing has been aimed at children. It was a large EU project. Uh, I partially also started at City University where I worked before. 
using um, gamification and um, serious game to teach children about antibiotics, about good and bad bugs, improving their awareness of, um, of hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and um, learning what micro microbes actually are. So this project was really good fun and kids enjoy it much more than actually being taught from textbooks, as you can imagine. Our, our, another project which finished last year is called MANTRA. Uh, MANTRA stands for Maternal and Newborn um, Technology for Increasing Maternal and Child Health and Geohazards in Nepal. So we work in this beautiful country with uh, rural, rural women who as you can imagine, most of them are uh, living in an increased poverty and there's also a high degree of illiteracy in this country, especially in women. So developing an educational game, a serious game again, which was only using pictograms to teach women how they can protect themselves and improve their maternal health and the health of their babies was really challenging and really rewarding projects. It was humbling to see that people who never had a mobile phone in their hand in a few minutes got used to using touch screens and uh, actually enjoy playing the game and really enjoy the sessions with us. Our, our longest running project is called ENRIC. ENRIC is information needs resource for infection and prevention and control and especially in the COVID times it was important to see how much things as boring as hand washing suddenly become a household story and how important it is to repeat these basic messages both for professionals and for members of public. And of course, we have worked extensively around the COVID pandemics. We have developed um, a project called Zoom or Not to Zoom. You will learn more about uh, monitoring uh, public uh, in the UK throughout the various stages of the pandemic. And we also developed an app. Um, it was called initially my lockdown journal, and then it was uh, updated as my activity journal to allow people to record the events they're doing and how they're enjoying. So as they have some sense of time and sense of enjoyment, they could come back and uh, they, could, they could repeat what they enjoy. And this will be also um, showcased later on. We also work with our, our colleagues in Barcelona, in Spain, in understanding uh, Twitter discourse throughout the uh, COVID-19 and looking at what citizens actually shared on social media during COVID. And you can say in most countries, citizens were quite upset with their government's response. And finally, um, we also have built on our existing collaboration with our colleagues in Northeast Brazil during COVID-19 and uh, we work jointly with a, a local institute in Pernambuco, Risk and Disaster Reduction and also um, SGIS initiative with our colleagues who are here today to improve uh, a prediction and uh, drone-based monitoring of crowds and compliance with restrictions in this uh, beautiful country. So if you're interested in the projects further, please look at the uh, report or talk to me after the event. So I would like to thank you, the DPHE team. You can see all of them there, from students and interns to our um, postdocs and collaborators who have been instrumental in contributing to this project and making all these success happen. So thank you very much to the DPA team. And I also would like to thank you to the MIVA team, our Brazilian colleagues uh, in two cities where we work, in Recife and in Campina Grande and uh, collaborators in both of these countries and also our colleagues uh, in, in Turkey who due to visa issues uh, could not actually be with us here today, unfortunately, but uh, they are the third country involved in the MIWA project. So that was the overview of the center and I would uh, kickstart the workshop. So we have four sessions planned for you today. So the first session is looking specifically at vector-borne diseases and using modeling in IoT technology and is based around our experience in Brazil. Then after a coffee break, we will have two sessions together. Session two is looking at digital interventions and we'll be presenting some of the apps we have developed, our colleagues in, in Portugal have developed, looking at um, an overview of what has been achieved about the cutting edge technology to combat um, the pandemic is and what we can learn for post-COVID times. And straight after session two, we will go to session three, looking at the kind of wider environmental and cultural factors which are important for one of health and surveillance. Then there's going to be a coffee break, a second coffee break, and at 6 p.m. we will come back here with a strategic panel, and I'm proud that we will receive a welcome for the panel for our new UCL Vice Provost for Research, Professor, Professor Grant Rees. So we're looking forward to have our VIP visitors for the panel, 
And after the panel, as I said, there will be um, some refreshments and, um, and drinks outside for us to network. So that's the plan for today. So thank you for listening to me, and I will hand over to the chair of the first session, Professor Tertio Ambrosi. Thank you, Patsy, and congratulations for the center. It's really lots of achievements, thank for you. sure. OK. Um, Let's start our session. Our first speaker is, is going to be uh, Dr. Thiago Massoni, Dr. Gisele Moreno. I would say that uh, Gisele had some family problems, so she won't be able to come this afternoon. But uh, Dr. Thiago is from the Federal University of Campina Grande and uh, is going to talk about the mosquito surveillance in Northeast Brazil, how it works and lessons learned. I'm not going to talk about the, the, bi the biography of the speakers. Is in the brochure of the event, so please go there and look at it. Uh, uh, with uh, three, three minutes before 10, I give a warning, one minute okay. before 10, and that's okay. 10. Thank you. I cut your head. Uh, <laughs> no, it's well, kidding. the first challenge is to figure out how to clip this in my, in my shirt. Uh, but Great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Asha. Very nice. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And after more than two years of uh, Zoom meetings and conferences and presentations, we're finally uh, believing that people are real again. So they are not you know, only avatars in, in some electronic uh, medium. Uh, but my name is Tiago. I'm a professor at this university here in Brazil. It's UFCG. CG is from Campina Grande. Uh, this, uh, Gisele is, is working with us. Uh, she's, as Tercio said, she's, uh, unfortunately, she's not able to, to come. But, uh, Together with uh, three universities uh, in Brazil, we participate, we're part of this uh, MEWAR uh, uh, project. Uh, UFCG is the blue one there uh, in the countryside of the northeast of Brazil. We have UFPE from Pernambuco and uh, in the, in the coast. And you have, we have USP uh, in Sao Paulo. So this is... Uh, when we talk about vector-borne disease uh, in general, the first one that comes to mind in Brazil is dengue, right? Uh, let me translate this uh, headline here that I just read in a newspaper. In Brazil, we had this year 500 deaths by dengue. Uh, and there are uh, 1. million reported cases from January to June. So it's a, really a big deal uh, in terms of uh, public health and in terms of, of course, the death rate and also uh, the, the, you know, the, the social debt, the, the social problem it causes because these, the, 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 the mosquito-borne uh, uh, diseases, uh, they uh, are very, uh, uh, the cases in this, uh, f from uh, these uh, diseases are uh, very uh, present in the whole population, in the, regardless of uh, uh, social uh, layer or uh, economic situation or if neighborhoods. This is it's only, uh, it's just very, uh, uh, the, the, the way that the disease is uh, transmitted uh, it's uh, independent of everything. You just have to uh, have a, a portion of water or still water where the mosquitoes breed. And then you can have this in the rainy seasons, for example. So in places where you don't have uh, appropriate care of the disposals and garbage, for example. So this is the, the, the biggest problem in, in public health one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, 
for fighting this uh, problem, the government has this uh, national program which tries to reduce the infestation of the mosquito. Well, so it tries to fight the vector for uh, try, uh, trying to avoid transmission and uh, reduce the incidence of these three diseases, mainly dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. Uh, and try to reduce deaths by the most dangerous uh, type of dengue, which is hemorrhagic dengue, which is probably uh, usually when you get, you, you, you get the disease in the second or the third time, it's more dangerous, uh, they're more risky to have this type of uh, more dangerous type of the disease. Uh, but the most, uh, the closest layer of uh, care in terms of public health, uh, the ones that are actually dealing with the population directly and trying to uh, minimize the, the, the transmission and the, the mosquito breeds are the community health workers, right? So this is the layer that we try to work with. So they are the, the, the first layer of healthcare because they go, uh, they are paid by the government, so they are uh, governor, uh, government uh, employees, staff. So they go to houses and visit the houses. They try to identify mosquito breeds and possible uh, uh, sources of infestation and they go and try to give a supplementary health care in terms of uh, at least educational purposes like going to the houses and trying to teach people uh, how to avoid it and how they take care of things in, at home and even uh, doing uh, uh, applying some live sites uh, on the uh, on the most dangerous or mo uh, most uh, appropriate places in a home, so each agent is usually overloaded with a lot of visits they have to do. Every two months, approximately one thousand properties must be visited by one agent only. Uh, in average, twenty-five to thirty properties each day. So there are. Uh, in, uh, several uh, the, the, the main responsibilities of these agents is first the detection of the positive cases, collect samples of the, the water to go to bring it to the labs and try to detect the breeds and also give a report of these visitations for inputting this into a national system which is used by the federal government for uh, Report, uh, reporting uh, uh, trends and trying to control and give some information uh, for decision making. Uh, but there are, you know, uh, you can see that there are uh, many, uh, many limitations in this work. Uh, first, it is uh, essentially low tech. So it's uh, based on paper forms that they have to, each property they go and they ask for the address, they write it down, they, they have to fill all the information that is required by this national system. Uh, but they have to do it on paper and then they, they go and put it in a, in a uh, uh, national system. The work is risky, the modest conditions, I'll talk more about this in the panel later. Uh, and usually lack of motivation and lack of training. Uh, uh, actually, the activity in general is poorly monitored because there are no, not enough agents and or supervisors to doing this work. So, one of the, some of the objectives with uh, or our uh, uh, work there, uh, our cooperation with with the agents, with the with the, the public uh, health system in these two cities, Campina Grande and Recife, uh, is to improve the tech. It's like uh, using trying to develop apps to replace paperwork for example uh, improve motivation trying to minimize repetitive work so they could use the app and um, maybe not required to uh, enter so much uh, repetitive information so 
they could get this uh, information from the sensors, IoT in general. So this could fuel them, uh, pre, uh, give them a pre-filled uh, report. And uh, improve the method. Actually improve method for providing info to population, which is the most time consuming uh, activity they have, usually. Uh, so, as I said, these are the two cities that we're working uh, with the agents uh, first. Recife, for example, you have these uh, regions here. Uh, this, this is one region, uh, one neighborhood of the city, right? So it's divided in small uh, portions. And this, each of these portions is assigned to one agent. So they have to uh, visit, it's a bit small here, but you have like 800 or eight, uh, 900 properties in each of these uh, uh, areas. And you have Campina Grande as well, using a system that is similar. There's a, a bit of a problem here because each city in Brazil, they have their own uh, policy for dealing with uh, some of the, uh, of the details of the work. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, I'm not giving so much, many details about the, the app or the, uh, uh, the system because uh, we can talk about, uh, about this later. But there is a system, uh, a small, uh, like a small application for the agents and one small application for the supervisors to assign the places and give the agents one part, uh, part of the information that they need to go to each resident and property and using the app with the smartphone, for example, for doing it. I'll give you more, uh, I'll talk more about the limitations in these suggestions or this, uh, these propositions we're doing in the panel uh, by the, uh, this evening here. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Thiago. Questions? No questions. So you said the, the, the people take 20 houses per, per day? Or uh, 20, it's, 20 is, uh, is probably uh, underestimate. <laughs> it's probably more, uh, yeah. 25 to 30, because there are shortage of agents. The, the, the career is not very attractive, I see. usually. So they always have less agents that they need. So it's usually they are overloaded with, uh, with uh, visiting, the, the visits they have. They actually cannot cover all the areas uh, of one neighborhood, for example, because of that. So they usually uh, have to gather uh, agents that have finished their uh, previous uh, assigned areas. So they go to an, a covered area, so they have to complete the cycle. Uh, so this is a, a big issue. It's like uh, having a, uh, the, the work they have to do, and they, they get awarded for doing a good job by getting more work, that's, right? That's good. So uh, th this, is, this is not very, uh, it's not a good incentive, right? For, for doing their goal, the uh, good work. Thank you. Any question? Oh, yes. I have a question. Um, so, are, completion, are agents awarded based on completion rates of, like, a, say, like a particular area? So, like, say, if an agent achieves like 100% completion of an area, are they given some kind of award or some kind of incentive, or is it just like a pat on the back? Well, there's, there's, this is a, actually a frequent complaint we get, we hear when we go and to talk to them, is that uh, if you complete your cycle early, before somebody else, uh, you're getting to cover other areas that are not covered before. So. This, this is the wrong incentive, right? This is like yeah. you, you give incentive for not doing your job because if you do your job well, you're going to have more work. So this is a frequent complaint we get. Um, and there's a pressure from the good agents, like the productive agents,
to the supervisors to uh, improve control over the agents they are not really productive so uh, there you have this uh, you know uh, small war between groups like the ones that are productive the ones that are not so productive so they're keeping uh, they, they keep this uh, the conflict so the supervisors do not have the information that is needed for doing this control and with this app for example we could do that they were very excited the supervisors were very excited with the idea that they could uh, follow the progress of each agent because they don't know that with the paper form they get the paper forms in the end of the cycle they don't know what happened in the in, in the in between right in the, uh, uh, in the meantime so with that like having your record every day the, the visitors you had the positive cases you detected uh, right out you in real time you would be like a big achievement so this is something that they are they were very excited about okay thank you very much professor Chai. thank you Our next speaker is Professor Wellington Pinheiro dos Santos uh, and uh, PhD students Ana Clara Gomes from the University Federal of Pernambuco and also the Polytechnic School uh, of the University of Pernambuco. And uh, the title is Spatial Temporal Forecasting for Dengue, Chikungunya Fever and Zika using uh, machine learning and artificial expert communities based on meta heuristics. And then uh, Anna is going to talk. Okay. Um, she, she will uh, speak after, after me. Okay. Three minutes before 10, I give a sign. One minute before 10, okay. then 10. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, so, this is our work spatial temporal forecasting for uh, dengue, chikungunya fever, and Zika using machine learning and artificial aspect committees based on metaheuristics. Uh, so, uh, uh, we were motivated. This, this work is inserted into the, uh, the, the, the biggest MUA project. And uh, here we are more focused on uh, the uh, data mining regarding the, the, all, all the data from, uh, from the, uh, the, the arboviruses that are transmitted from the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fact that uh, uh, in the, uh, these, uh, the, the emergences of, of more infectious diseases, uh, like the ones we are talking about, are uh, uh, very correlated, uh, strongly correlated with uh, the climatic changes and, and environmental changes uh, and so on. So uh, as a consequence of uh, inviting uh, uh, the human populations, inviting uh, the new environments, new biomas. We have the emergence of new viruses that migrate from animal populations to human populations. Uh, so uh, we uh, we hope that uh, uh, joining variables from multiple um, uh, multiple databases uh, could they get the prediction of these these diseases. Uh, but uh, in fact, we don't know in which case, uh, uh, which are the most important factors that affect the, the forecasting of these diseases. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, using meteoristic methods, uh, mostly uh, 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 based on the evolutionary computing and so on intelligence, uh, it could highlight uh, uh, what are the most rele relevant factors that could optimize uh, um, uh, forecasting model. So uh, we are we are proposing an uh, artificial uh, experts committee, and in in this uh, this artificial experts committee, uh, each uh, artificial uh, expert uh, is modeled as a, a, as an algorithm for uh, uh, optimization and search. Uh, so uh, we uh, adapted uh, 
Uh, I think it's five, five algorithms. So uh, our research hypothesis, hypothesis that, uh, that uh, geographic information databases uh, with uh, climatic, environmental, and health information could be useful to build uh, efficient disease predictors that uh, could be able to predict uh, the spatial temporal distribution of cases with uh, acceptable error. And uh, we can combine uh, different uh, intelligent agents to aid to determine the most important variables uh, for the forecasting task. Uh, our area under study was the city of Recife that uh, was already presented by, by my colleague Tiago. Uh, it's located in the northeastern uh, region of Brazil. It's a uh, 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 part of, of the, the uh, uh, tropical area that is uh, almost 70% of the, the country. Uh, and we are uh, in, uh, in this research, we use uh, uh, the following databases. Uh, use the uh, APAC database, that is a database that uh, 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 in, in which we collect the, the, it's a public database and in which we collect the information, the geographic information from the climactic variables uh, like the, the, the rainfall data and uh, uh, they, uh, they, have, uh, they collect uh, uh, this information daily using uh, latitude and longitude as well. Uh, we also use the uh, information from the National Institute of Meteorology uh, in MET, uh, temperature in, in uh, Celsius degrees, wind speed, uh, and uh, we collected this information for, from three uh, meteorological stations in Recife. And uh, we also have used a uh, 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 public database that, that was uh, given uh, to us uh, in this database. We have uh, the uh, information from uh, the years 2013 to 2016 from the cases and uh, we, uh, about the cases of uh, dengue, chikungunya, zika, and where these cases were registered. So um, here is the uh, general overview of what we think about uh, 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 could be a, 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 a good system to, to aid the, the forecasting of the number of viruses. Uh, so uh, we have multiple uh, databases, databases that uh, already exist, like the, uh, uh, the ones that in which we can get uh, 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 wind speed, geospatial uh, information, temperature, uh, rainfall, uh, and uh, the databases that uh, are, are furnished by the, the public system, the Brazilian public system, and in which we can get uh, the uh, cases and the partial addresses of the, the patients. And uh, as we expect uh, within the MUR project, we could have uh, another database to, to fit this system the, uh, that could be uh, uh, built by uh, the geocodification of the breeding sites, mosquito breeding sites. The, and, and in this case, we have the, the, the app, uh, the app dedicated for the, the environmental health agents, to, agents to, uh, to, to fill this database. So our proposal is uh, collecting all this data and forming uh, uh, geodata from building maps and uh, making the uh, forecasting and analyzing uh, what, what are the, 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 the more important uh, variables involved in prediction. So this is the general overview. This is our hope uh, to, to build a, a complete system. Uh, and now uh, Anna Clara is going to talk about uh, the uh, experimental results. Okay, uh, the result is we considered uh, good if we uh, have a, okay, 
the result is considered good. If we have a, a Ray coefficient, is greater than 90 point, uh, 0 0.9, and the RMSA is less than 5%. Uh, the good results, the, the, I'm sorry, good results uh, can be obtained in MLP, uh, SBM, A, ALM, and Randall Forest. Uh, the, 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 the best is model uh, considering the uh, <coughs> coefficient uh, RMSL and the trying, the trying time is the uh, rental forest with uh, a tree uh, with a 10 hour. Then three. Uh, good. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so these are the uh, the uh, our uh, qualitative results. Uh, so uh, uh, here we have the forecasting results for the uh, six by uh, by masters from uh, year 2014. Uh, so we can see that uh, in this uh, 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 red and orange areas in the south mainly and uh, uh, almost in the west, uh, we have uh, much, much more cases, much more cases of, uh, in this case, dengue, okay? But uh, in the year 2015, uh, we had the, the occurrence of uh, Zika virus. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, cases of dengue, uh, chikungunya fever, and Zika virus. So we can we could perceive that uh, there were uh, uh, in the following year and uh, next year uh, we had uh, more cases in the, the beginning of the year in the north, uh, and uh, in the, the 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 end of the year. Uh, we had uh, some uh, 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 a more controlled situation, but uh, we believe that the number of environmental health agents is still uh, insufficient because uh, the situation in the end of the year 2015 was uh, was not as good as uh, the uh, the authorities, the health authorities, wanted to be. Uh, in year 2016, after the uh, the occurrence of the uh, uh, the uh, Zika virus outbreak, uh, we had a even worse situation. Uh, so uh, we can see that it's quite important to uh, not only adopt new technologies, but uh, uh, to augment the the, the teams of uh, uh, the uh, for the. Uh, surveillance as well. So uh, we, uh, with this proposal we were able to, uh, to get uh, predictions with uh, relatively uh, good uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative results using the, uh, the Pearson coefficient, R coefficient, it was uh, uh, higher than 0 0.9 uh, then, and the, the percentile RMSE uh, was above 5%, and our committee of artificial experts uh, was able to identify the most relevant factors in uh, each uh, bimester. So uh, that was we we had to present to you uh, today, but we have the, uh, the opportunity to, to talk a bit more about this work. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Professor Wellington. Any questions for them? Please.
Okay, uh, let's start by the end. Okay, uh, so uh, we organized the data uh, in the following, uh, according to the, the following uh, uh, organization. Uh, we, we had to follow uh, the same organization that is adopted, uh, that nationally adopted by the, the public health Brazilian system. So uh, in, in order to make uh, forecastings uh, regarding uh, uh, arboviruses, uh, they use uh, as, a, as a base the bimester. So they divide the year into uh, six bimesters, January, February, uh, March, April, and so on. So uh, we had this as unities. So in order to, uh, uh, in, in, uh, to, to add the, the, fact, the climatic factors, we had to, uh, to add the, the uh, the sample average of the, uh, each month. So we have the number, uh, the total number of cases in the, our, uh, uh, sorry, our, our window of uh, prediction is a year. Because uh, why were, uh, are we using year? Uh, because uh, due to the, the uh, life cycle of the fire, of the, 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 the mosquito, because uh, the mosquito uh, lived just for two, three weeks, but the eggs could uh, survive uh, from uh, the summer to the rainy stations until a year. So it's recommended to, uh, in order to, to try to forecast uh, uh, that you could uh, involve not, not just the, the, the mosquito lice, but uh, 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 the, uh, this, the surviving of the egg as well. So we have, uh, we have as a, a prediction window a year, and uh, using a year, we have, uh, uh, we have the following factors. We have the, uh, for uh, each bimester, from the six bimesters, the number of cases, okay? Uh, the uh, latitude, longitude, number of cases, um, the uh, sample uh, temperature average, uh, this, uh, this uh, sample uh, humidity average uh, from each month, okay, the, the, the sample average from each month, and uh, wind, uh, wind speed. So we have, uh, I think we have 44, 44 attributes, okay, and we collect this from the, 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 uh, uh, the meteorological stations, but uh, uh, since we have just three uh, meteorological stations, we have to, uh, to make uh, interpolations to uh, generate uh, an, irregular, uh, an irregular grid and to uh, estimate the, 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 this, uh, this data in the uh, unknown latitudes and longitudes. Uh, may I suggest to continue during the cough break? So okay, it'll be fine. And sorry, because so for the sake of time. Please. Can, okay, could be afterwards. Okay, sorry for Thank the long you. answer. No, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ryan, for Anna. Beautiful. Okay. okay, our next speaker is uh, Miss Aisha Odorsery yes. from the House, actually, from the Center for Digital Public Health uh, in Emergence here at the University College of London. And she's going to talk about the smart mosquito uh, over traps and mobile surveillance. So, hello everyone. Uh, as Tercio introduced me, I'm a, P I'm a third year PhD student at the Digital Public Health uh, Center 
So I'm, I'm part of the Monware project where it's like running in Brazil. I'm doing my PhD as part of this project as well. So um, today I'm to, I will talk, I will, I, to be honest, I just changed my mind. I will just skip a part, which is where, because we already covered by Tiago uh, part. So I will not talk more about the app we develop. So what we did for Brazil so far is just from the DBHD part is like we developed a mobile app where we have like a platform where for the manager, uh, for the manager agents and for the agents at the field. So one for the managing and allocating the task and the, the other side, the agents can like just recording instead of the paper form which Tiago have discussed. So I think this bit is already covered by uh, Tiago. And again, like we have a lot, we're going through several challenges in the ground. Unfortunately, we wasn't involved because of COVID. So Tiago is the first person like to re report all these challenge. So uh, probably at the panel, we will discuss more about the challenges of piloting an app at the, at the field. So the second bit of what I'm working on is like a smart, uh, IoT platforms or IoT based platform, which is Internet of Things, or maybe we can simply just say sensor devices, is dependent on like what you are collecting. So uh, mainly what I'm doing, this bit is more like, we actually developed already like a, um, a prototype. It's an IoT based uh, smart, we call it smart over trap system. Uh, it's actually like the, the idea is coming like from, from two, from two parts. Like the background behind this idea is like, if you wanted to control mosquito, which is very obvious, is like we will go back to the climate things and the water because the mosquito will breed only on the water, cannot breed in different environments. This is the habitat plus the weather. So two factors are two, two main things significantly impact the, the mosquito during her life cycle. So in terms of the water variables, like we are, we're, sorry, the weather variables, we are focusing in three things, which is the temperature, uh, humidity, and air pressure. In terms of the, of the water, it's more like a visual chemical parameters of the water or the water quality of the, of the water itself, where is the, where, where. Yeah, I will, I will keep this for the later. So we're actually collecting some parameters, which is considered as a quality, water quality parameters. If you say, why, why, why this idea? What's the, what's the point of having real-time data or like continuous real-time data? Why you are using sensors? Yes, like what's, what's exists now in the literature is more focusing on remote sensing we will focus in water station as a tool to collect the data. So the main idea behind our project is like really is about how to collect the data. So we try to find a way to collect the data, to have continuous data, real time, and like more clean and robust system rather than having like the water station because we thought, or we think actually the, the mosquito is like, first of all, it's like species specific and context specific. So it's very impacted by where it's, where the, where it's located, where the, it's like even the altitude, the elevation things is very important. So we, we thought like having, building your model in a data that's at a final spatial scale, not a large scale, will, will have a huge or significant impact on the modeling accuracy. So from here, we came up with the idea of the water sensor. One more thing is about what Willington said when he answered one of the questions was very important. Controlling the mosquito at the life, you have to know which life, like the life cycle of the mosquito starts by eggs, larvae, and then an adult mosquito. Deciding which, which uh, at which levels, uh, at, which, at, which, at which stage of the life cycle is very important. So controlling the mosquito as an adult, which is we will have a talk about it as well, we will, is, is, still, is still like significant. However, like controlling it at the beginning, at eggs level and larvae level will have more significantly impact, significant impact comparing at adult stage. Sometimes say, some, some, some literature saying like, is approved and it's like controlling the mosquito at the adult level, maybe it's quite late to take control measurements or like to prevent any outbreak. So if you manage to control at the, which is what they call it, a mature stage, it's, it's more significant. So this is how the ideas come about the IoT water based system. So what we call, we call this system mosquito over trap IoT sensing system. Why we call it over trap? Because we, we deployed, we, the idea is to deploy these sensor in the IoT, in the over trap buckets. So we will use the uh, over trap bucket and we will deploy, implement or place our props and collect the, the parameters through these sensors. So what the system will give us, will give you a real-time data, continuous data. The system's kind of robust, so it's, you, you don't need to go to the field, you don't need to like having also manual input. 
The, also, for the water pumps, there is one, one like maybe challenge. Like most of the people, how they do it, they use a portable, a portable like multi-parameter sensor, and then you have to go to the field by yourself, collect the data, and go back. Or sometimes they implement some sensor in the field and keep it running, but still, it's the, the data will be collected in like a temporary memory, memory, and then you have to go to the field, take this memory. So again, it's like you need human involved, and would, and then the accuracy. I, I, um, Again, it's not, it's, you need to have a continuous data to see the impact, especially in the tropical area where the, the elevation is making a big difference, where like from the north of the city to the south of the city, the climate is totally different. So this is one thing we, we are like hoping the big achievement is to have real time and continuous data instead of like instance data. This will help us to build more robust model as well in terms of like understanding the impact of the environment on mosquito breeding or at the, at the level of the production and the development, we will see how these parameters could really impact the, the, the production and the, of, the, of, the mosquitoes, of the mosquito. Maybe it's if we have, if we like having integrate these data with other data sources, we can have like an, uh, finding and most influential variables or drivers in terms of mosquito breeding as well. So putting this Having this data with other data sources will make, help us to build a more robust and more accurate uh, uh, modeling. So this is an architecture of the system, like the, how it's built in terms of hardware and the software as well. Uh, the system is like implemented around Arduino uh, board. It's like Arduino, which have also like a, um, a built-in SIM card, which is one of the, I would say, good characteristic about this board and this is why we use it. So it's depend on the network. So you, the same card, you don't need like a GCM or something else. It's the same card, the same board. So we use the same board with the, with the built in SIM card. The system is, is, is working, is, is designed to be working with a solar power system as well as the power supply. Okay, I have three minutes left. And then the software all is on the server. So it all in the cloud server. So that's me and you can get the data with what's happening now. I'm here in London, I'm receiving the data from the census. So this is how the system looks like. This is the first prototype of the system. We are planning to make, like, we based on the first uh, primary analysis of the data, we decided to make some amendments. So this is the first prototype and hopefully next version is coming with, like, with some adding more sensors and do some extra things based on the first analysis. This is where we deployed the first system. It was deployed in the Natural History Museum of Funchal. Data is coming from the sensor. However, we are collaborating with the health environmental agent there as well. So they, we are receiving a weekly data about uh, the eggs and larvae. And then we will have like a data set, enough data set to make, to make our analysis. So this is, the system has been deployed since November last year. So probably like six months or above. Yeah, so this is the type of data we are receiving. We have the maps over here. Here is actually, this is maybe the most important bit, which is the future work for us. Like we, we this, is the, um, this is the map of Madeira. And these are the number of the over trap they have so far. Uh, you can see the focus here in Funchal, where it's located. I think this is like the main capital in the tourism area, the capital of the island. So this is why the focus is here. Plus the over side, the, the middle, and the, it's like the mountain side. And they, again, the focus in the, where the human are coming, which is we expect the mosquito to be more. They do have um, <coughs> over 100 uh, over trap, but we are planning to deploy more sensors to have more as well robust data, probably about 20 systems to be across similar to what we have deployed, to be also installed, placed in the over trap one minute and that's it so this is the team at Madeira we're supposed to have like Professor Nono who is not here and Dr. Brona as well who's helping us in running this part so this is the Madeira team who helped us to do this in short notes we just collaborate during the COVID and it was nice like we do everything quick although like it was challenging to go and travel but they we got a very good support from the people there and we have some people as well today to report about other senses. So that's it, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah. Questions? Please. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. Uh, one question about uh, transmission of data. Yes. So uh, how uh, is data from the uh, orbital uh, 
transmitted to cloud. Yes. And I, I think in your slide there was 3G or... Yeah, SIM card. So the, same, the, um, the Arduino board itself have a built-in SIM card. This is why I'm saying, I, I, if you ask me why you choose this, like Arduino is almost the same. So this was the best specific features about this board is like having the SIM card so you don't need like shield or GCM or like other. So it's, you just both put the card inside, the SIM card inside that and then... It's likely to affect the data from areas where uh, no. the yeah, this is like then you need to have something different, which is like we, we said some of our clients suggest the idea of the LoRa. So in case if the, uh, there is the coverage is not good, so then you need a LoRa. However, the accuracy may not be good enough, uh, good as well as the, as the SIM card, as the normal network. Also, there is another solution, but again, we will lose the real-time data if we do, if we do like the memory card or it's like inside, just temporarily, but then the, once the connection is back, you can send the data remotely. But again, you lose the idea of like real-time data, but still the solution in case of like no coverage. And just out of curiosity, uh, yeah. uh, is it like a training season will impact the battery uh, mm. life? Whether That's a good question. Will it be able to, to, to be charged during the training season? It depends where you're locating the stuff. So, the, so yeah, prob like, this is why the tropical areas must be, uh, probably most of the year there is a sun. So we expect like this will be, but not perfect as the power supply. But I would say with the, like for example, in Brazil, I think the situation would be much better compared even to Madeira, because most of this year, like they do have the sun. Yeah, I would say it's still, it's still like a, one of the challenge. The, the ideal solution is the power supply, but this is an alternative solution in case of, but again, for the raining is depend, yeah, the, the solar, like the, if you don't have, the solar panel, as you know, like I think you know, since you asked, like, is that you can, you can charge it where it's during half the day. If there's a battery still, you can keep running. Plus the system has not, he's not using too much power because we don't like having too much, the data also itself is not heavy, it's not image, it's not videos. Yeah. Okay. Please. The cost efficient. Yes, yeah, so if you compare, yeah, this one is a good, a good question. Maybe if you compare the on-shelf multi-parameter sensors, the manual one, like it's almost like more than triple the price of like assembling these, put these the one box together will cost you uh, absolutely, is comparing with what's like an on-shelf product, yeah. That is cost effective, it's constant cost effective. Yeah, go One on. quick question. Say it again, sorry. Yes, yes. Therefore, yeah, this is the map one, yeah. No, you pass. No, no. Okay, sir. Oh, wow. Okay, the, the, the deployment, yeah, the deployment slide, okay. Yes, it's collecting. So, so uh, what we have here is actually just three props. Three props, one is for, oh, sorry. One for the temperature, one for the, humi no, sorry, props. One for the pH, one for the dissolved oxygen, one for the water temperature. And now we're planning to add more uh, like water quality sensor because again, we found like the mosquito is more like specific, species specific. So we need to know if like some parameters may be important for some species, specific species. So we don't want to like ignore something. We want to include all the water quality parameters. So for example, conductivity, salinity is not included in this prototype. However, in the future one, in the future version of the system, we will have more sensors. And in the, in the box itself, you can see there is like, there is the weather sensors. Yeah, it's all just here, like it's collecting weather, humidity and air pressure. Okay. Yes. I think time's over. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Awar Moussa from the Department of, of Geography, University of College London. And he's going to speak about the use of spatial temporal models for predicting the burden of mosquito infection in Brazilian cities. That's good. Mm. 
Hello, can you folks hear me? Perfect. Okie dokie. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone. And first of all, I just want to give a, a shout out to the PI and to my colleagues, uh, Tiago, Wellington, Anna, and Aisha, for just setting the tone. You know, so, um, my presentation, uh, as Professor um, Wellington spoke about predicting cases, right? Mine is more focused on uh, risk assessment for household levels of infestation. Um, across neighborhoods in Recife. And uh, basically we want to uh, apply some kind of spatial temporal model to uh, understand and quantify the risk trajectory of mosquito infestation across these neighborhoods uh, during a certain time uh, interval, say January 2015 up until October 2019 using routine data in order to kind of inform us of uh, which neighborhoods have uh, sustained risks. So just to kind of set the, set the tone, um, so there are many different species of uh, mosquitoes. So the most infamous um, family is the Anopheles, which uh, is responsible for transmitting uh, a parasitic protozoa uh, called the Plasmodium, which in turn causes um, malaria in humans. And then you have this, another infamous uh, species, which is the Aedes uh, species, which there are two, broadly two common types, which is the Aedes um, aegypti and the Aedes uh, albopictus. And these are uh, known for causing neglected tropical diseases such as dengue, uh, chikungunya, yellow fever, and Zika as well as uh, Rift Valley, uh, Rift, uh, Valley uh, fever as well. Just to quickly illustrate the transmission cycle, and so you have two distinct populations. So you have the uh, female Aedes mosquitoes population, and you have a group of susceptibles. And so the, the, the virus is transmitted by the female uh, mosquitoes, but for them in turn to get infected, they must get into into contact with someone who has already been bitten by an infected mosquito. Once that mosquito takes a blood milk from that infected host, uh, that, that female mosquito gets infected, maybe in their early stages in their life cycle as well. And then one week after, they'll go and take another blood meal so that they can use it for nourishing their eggs for egg production. And then that's how the kind of transmission cycles kind of retain. And so it's like the, they'll take a blood meal and then they would infect another host as well. And then they'll produce a progeny which would contribute again to their population. But then that female mosquito had fulfilled her duty and then she passes away. And so that's how the cycle is retained. So, just to kind of also illustrate the kind of global distribution of where these mosquitoes are. So this is a quite an interesting map because this was developed sometime in the 1950s. So there is a really ancient uh, atlas called the Atlas of Diseases, which is published in the American Geographical Society. And you can have access to so many old disease maps, but what they've done is uh, they've tried to kind of outline the... Um, transmission uh, uh, areas of where uh, yellow fever and uh, dengue can occur. And you can see that it is mainly concentrated in uh, the central part of sub-Saharan Africa, but also like uh, in, in a major section of uh, South America where you can see uh, a significant chunk of the northwest of Brazil is also like a, an area where uh, uh, the dengue and yellow fever occurrence occur. But also, like, the map on the um, bottom right um, shows you points of where uh, vectors are present. And so this was actually done in the 1954. If we fast forward in time, right, where we have GIS and many data, we're able to use, like, quite a lot of models such as ecological niches or machine learning to kind of quantify the boundaries of where these mosquitoes exist. And what they, what they show here is the red parts is where um, 
these environments are suitable for the uh, Aedes aegypti and the Aedes albopictus. And you can see there's a significant chunk in Brazil where um, these uh, mosquito, mosquito species exist as well. In terms of cases as well, we are able to determine as well like, okay, these type of mosquitoes where they report cases of the main type of abroviruses, so Zika, yellow fever, chikungunya, and Rift Valley, Rift Valley uh, fever as well, where countries have all the case, all the, the disease type uh, reported there. And you can see in Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, they have all the diseases reported there. But throughout of uh, uh, South America, with the exception of Uruguay and Chile, all the countries, they report at least four out of five types of the diseases as well. And Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever, and Chikungunya is endemic in those countries. And so it's quite uh, an immense public health problem, especially within a South American context. So this is where, like, the Miwa family comes into play. And uh, we have like a really strong collabor collaborative ties with, um, you know, uh, community health workers in Recife, but also in uh, Campina Grande. And these are two uh, cities that have been hit pretty hard by the Zika uh, epidemic during 2015-16, uh, okay? And what we do is uh, we are trying to kind of, you know, boost capacity in terms of like getting data and uh, also using the app, but also trying to find uh, like uh, other factors like sanitation to try and, uh, you know, limit these uh, risk factors as well. But also we're trying to also, you know, <coughs> generate the capacity of mapping and predicting these hotspots and breeding sites too as well. Um, this is just an image to show you some of the kind of samples that are collected uh, there. So uh, the uh, community health workers or agents, uh, thank you, uh, go there to take these water samples to kind of measure like levels of concentration of like these larvae that are present in households and try to document them in papers this is also us, uh, you know, getting into contact with this and to kind of showcase the kind of Zika app as well to kind of help boost them in recording uh, uh, these occurrences at a household level and so that we can have point level data. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, the data that is presented to us is recorded and kind of aggregated down to a neighborhood level. And the way the agents operate is on every two monthly interval across the year, they'll visit houses and to do a survey and record whether or not it is infested with either a mosquito or larvae. And just to kind of show, when they inspect a house, um, so these are the type of classifications or the, of how to identify whether a house is infected or not. And these are the kind of things, containers that they will check. So they'll check things like water tanks, they'll check deposits in uh, containers that are used for you know, domestic usage, as well as in the external property as well. And so, yeah, just to kind of mention again, just to kind of reiterate, so um, we, I currently have uh, you know, routinely collected data that is provided by um, the um, Environmental Health Agency from Recife, and uh, I have data on the uh, neighborhoods, and uh, so this kind of preliminary analysis that I've done, I used uh, a spatial temporal model just to look at the kind of trajectories and uh, look at what is the overall risk. And uh, what for each neighborhood, we have like the overall number of houses that were surveyed, but also the number of houses that were identified to be infected as well. And what we did was uh, I just fitted a, a binomial, uh, a Bayesian a multivariable binomial regression to just quantify the odds ratio, which is basically uh, 
kind of like an epidemiologic measure that tells you whether if there's an increased risk or a decreased risk. So if you have an odds ratio that is equal to one, then there is no risk at all. But if it's below one, there's a reduced risk. And if it is above one, then there's an increased risk. And we try to get them specific to each neighborhood, but also specific to each cycle as well. And so this was the kind of end product that we had here. And so you have the list of neighborhoods, and then you have like uh, the cycle. So we have 57 cycles from the beginning of January 2015 going down to October. That, and what I wanted to do was just to see uh, the trajectory, whether if a neighbor had a sustained reduced risk of infestation or if it was like sustained elevated risk of infestation. And what we did was just to kind of generate a product to kind of summarize this into this kind of map here. And so if it was sustained as red, which was significant, then we'd paint the neighborhood as red. And if it was blue, we'll paint it as blue. And if it transitioned from low risk to high risk, you had like a kind of light shade of red. And if it was from high risk to low risk, you had a light shade of blue. And if it, if it wasn't significant throughout, then we just kept it white. And so this is just kind of like a concept kind of and preliminary thing, because we just want to get point data, which is high resolution, and only the app which Aisha, which Tiago had mentioned, can achieve that, okay? And so yeah, that's all folks. And so I just want to give a quick shout out to the Miwa family, and also I just would like to thank everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, let me ask you, you show a map that uh, at least four kinds of disease happens in, in Brazil. But the, other, the previous map you show where there is no uh, action from the mosquito in a large area in the central east of Brazil and the south of Amazon. So, yeah, the, uh, uh, this one you show that uh, at least four of the five diseases reported. Yes. And the previous one? Or the previous one, yeah, this one. Yeah, it's not suitable for either. Uh, yes. I had you know, this green area here. It's a very large area in the center, in the center east of Brazil. Yes, so this, this work was published by uh, Lita et al. And the data that they used was uh, so the ADIS uh, compendium. And what they've done was they had to bring points of surveys that was reported from since, if I could remember, 1973 up to date. Okay. And so what they did was they had to take points from like, you know, national health agencies that are willing to share them those surveys. But they also had to do like a literature kind of search and they kind of had to, they had to kind of extract all the, all the points that was reported in those papers as well and geolocated them. And what they did was they used those points to kind of generate this map. Okay. So my thinking is that perhaps maybe they didn't get any studies or any points on the this points area. On the, the, yeah. yeah. So I think they weren't able to kind of generate any kind of results here. Yeah, well, yeah. over the Andes probably in the, the south of South America, it's almost desert and quite cold. So, okay. But OK. Exactly. I think it's a good point. Um, yeah. Questions? Any question? Oh, he's a good teacher. I can see that. <laughs> oh, there is one. More. Yes, of course. Because I mean, uh, already like the mosquitoes are moving more north as well. In fact, when I was talking about the Rift Valley fever, that's just one example of it actually penetrating into the Americas as well. And um, yeah, North America, in fact. And yeah, I'm sure like, I'm sure because like the, these maps that were generated, because mine, the, the compendium, they use points that was from 2014. I wouldn't be surprised if I was to actually do a quick Google search to see if there are any publications on uh, these type of diseases in these areas as well. And so, yeah, I think that uh, 
that the the boundary of these disease would would expand not just like you know north southwards, but it's also going to expand in this this direction as well. Yeah. There are some reports that the yellow fever and even malaria is going up the Andes Mountain. Actually, it wasn't only on the the bottom, but now it's the more high levels. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And at last, but not at least, our speaker, uh, Professor Dinarte Vasconcelos from ITI, Larsis, from the Instituto Superior Técnico from yes. Lisbon. Sorry. And the title is going to be Acoustic Sensors for Monitoring Ecosystem. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. Uh, I will talk a little. I will talk a little bit about the mosquito in Madeira Island, and after that I will talk the, the sensors that uh, we are being uh, developed. First, the mosquito vector monitoring can be divided in three big approaches. The traditional one, the acoustic and non-acoustic approach. The traditional one is the, the using the manual, uh, manual uh, trumps to count the mosquitoes and identify them. In the acoustic, we can use the, the audio analysis uh, methods, machine learning and deep learning methods, and the acoustic uh, trump devices too. This non-acoustic device is more to identify the breeding sites. So the, normally they use machine vision uh, based techniques via image processing and high, high speed cameras. And this, in this approach can be included the uh, ISS sensors too. So here we have the traditional method. That's, uh, it's uh, been done uh, in Madeira Island. Uh, as we know, is a time-consuming uh, method. It's requiring people to go to the different traps and collect the data. So here in this image, we have in, the, in red, we have the presence of mosquitoes through the, through the eggs, and in blue is not the presence of the mosquitoes. Here is the office trap that normally we use in Madeira with a Velcro tape where the mosquitoes go there and put uh, their eggs. Normally, this one is just applied for the, for the Aedes aegypti. Here, uh, Funchal is the capital of Madeira Island, mainly is a, a tourist I, a touristic uh, island. So the, the municipality of, of Funchal start monitoring the, the city in October 2005, and uh, the first outbreaks uh, appears in 2013. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the, the city has uh, 28 uh, traps, in the, in the city, and in Madeira we just have the Aedes aegypti and the Culex uh, mosquito, that is only these two types of mosquito that can transmit the diseases. We have other species, but they are endemic, but uh, they don't transmit the diseases. Here we have a small graph the, for, the, for the first outbreak that's uh, happening that's happen in uh, Madeira Island. In the y-axis we have the number of weeks, uh, one, one here, have uh, uh, 52 uh, uh, weeks, so the peaks normally, uh, the number of cases occurs in the October, so the, normal, the total cases was uh, 1,080 uh, cases, maybe for a small island like uh, mine, maybe it's a big number. Here we have just a small graph uh, that's showing the trap positivity, of uh, over uh, 2020, the, they hit the peak normally in the in the summer and the beginning of winter, like in the September, October. Now I will talk about the, the prototypes that were, have uh, been developed and that, that are being uh, developed. The first prototype is the locomobile. Uh, it's composed by a layer, a layer of sensors. Uh, like microphone, temperature, and, re and relative humidity. We think that these two, uh, these two environmental uh, readings is the most important to classify the mosquito. And uh, this prototype uh, uses open source hardware, the particle photon microcontroller, uh, have a powerful core and a Wi-Fi chips, chip that uh, connects all the sensors and sends the data to, to our server. We have two uh, local storage too, IRTC, 
to see the, the timestamp when the, the mosquito passed close to the sensor. And in this approach, uh, we just used the, the classification based on the frequency of each mosquito. Uh, as, we are, as I already said, we sent the data to our uh, web-based uh, interface. We can search and download the sounds and the spectrograms, the spectrograms too. But uh, this first version has some issues. Uh, like in remote locations, we don't have always Wi-Fi. So it's a challenge. We need to change the, the prototype. When we use the Wi-Fi communication, still consume a lot of power. And one, one important feature that we, are, uh, that we are looking for is to change the audio quality parameters, like the gain and the volume. Because in, when we are in the presence of uh, high environmental noise, uh, environmental, uh, when we are in the presence of uh, and, uh, on the high uh, noise environment, we need to change the gain. And we are in the low environmental gain, we can increase the gain to hear better. And we, in this prototype, we don't have a self-charge battery system too. And this prototype is limited to just samples that can go until, until uh, 8K. So we merge with the version 2 that have some uh, environmental sensors that have a self-battery system and now can go until 44.1K. We can adjust locally and uh, remote development and the gain. We can listen the sounds in the field that we are capturing. And this, uh, uh, this version have, have the LoRa technology that is a long range communication uh, technology that can be used to for the data to the, from some gateway and uh, sent to the server. This one, uh, have, we can save some uh, consumption here because uh, compared with the Wi-Fi technology. Here uh, is the, the gateway that we are, the, currently we have three, three gateways, LoRa gateways installed in the, in the main city of Funchal. Uh, the, the municipality have more uh, 13 uh, gateways, so we have a total of uh, 16 gateways that cover all the area of Funchal. So as this load is a low power technology, long range and long band solution. That picture there is the dashboard that we can see the gateways and the devices that are connected. And we can imagine there the, the data, lab, the acoustic uh, uh, recordings and the, the metadata like uh, uh, the temperature and the relative humidity. So these pictures are the first uh, deployment that we made in Thailand. So, but we found some issues too, like how we can uh, estimate the mosquito density. Uh, to do that, we need to count the mosquitoes. So using acoustic sensors, some, somehow it's difficult to count them. It still consumes some energy, and we have, when we have in the presence of uh, high environmental noise, we have a loss, uh, the classification method that we use is, uh, is not good. In this prototype, to classificate the mosquitoes, we use the audio features. We have the most used, the 34 audio features, time domain, frequency, spectral, and the comma features too. Here we have a box bot uh, about the, for the, uh, all 34 features. The best one is the, the male frequency spectral coefficients come from 1 to 13. And in blue, we have the Kulix, and in brown, we have the Aiza Gypsy. Here is our system that we are implementing. We have this uh, pre-processing stage that segment the audio, uh, uh, use the best, uh, the best audio features. Uh, after that, uh, in the proce uh, processing stage, we, we use the clustering uh, method because, why we use this, the, the clustering? Because it's a lightweight method that we can use on, in the onboard on devices. We have three, three types of clusters for Aedza Gypsy cool extent for environmental noise. Here is this uh, small overview in this table about the best features to classify the mosquitoes. When we have the presence of noise, uh, still the currency drop a little bit, but uh, is around 81.7%, I think is a good occurrence. And, we have, and we, the method that we use is GMM and the Gibbs sampler methods. Here in this picture, in the way we have the noise, 
Uh, in blue, we have the Aids Aegypti, and in, in the red, we have the Kulix for uh, spectral, sp uh, spectral centroid and spectral spread. So we merge with the thread, the version 3, that have now um, a more powerful uh, core, have more memory for the machine learning algorithms, and have the infrared technology. Here is the overview about the, the models. In red, the, the, the LoRa model, orange, the acoustic one, the yellow, the environmental model, white, the optical model. In purple, we have the, the, the audio model. And cyan, we have the memory. In black, the core. And blue, the battery model. Here, we have the acoustic system, the, the optical system. We use uh, the, uh, Fresnel lens to focus the, the uh, RI emitter. And we have an uh, array box that receive uh, is is like a box when the mosquito pass through they the the device uh, count them and classify and classify them here we have a small video how to adjust the and focus the fresnel lens here we have the optical shield that uh, uh, can be used for uh, for fresnel lens that composing a far far away far away and we have to provide a more uh, robust uh, architecture, we, uh, we, uh, we build four types of adapter. For high emitter, five millimeters. For high emitter, uh, with for uh, three millimeters. For a small uh, Fresnel lens and R receiver. Here's just a small comparison about all the, the versions that we have deployment. Here's the, the, the completion power about for the three versions that we, that we do. And here is the final uh, system that we want to, to implement. We have the acoustic uh, process to trigger the acoustic uh, uh, classification system. We, we send through LoRa, and the LoRa we can use, uh, you can enter in the, uh, the web-based interface and then see the, the, which type of mosquitoes that we detected and so on. Okay, thank you so much. Professor Vasconcelos, questions? Yes, please. Thanks very much. That was a really great talk, um, Robert. Um, so I have a couple of questions, actually. Firstly, um, what's your accuracy for the acoustic volume for each species? You know, are you getting good accuracy? And the second, are there other ways of doing it, like deep learning? Could you use acoustic deep learning for all those methods? Because if you're extracting paralysis, it might be better to Yes. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one is uh, the accuracy. I think is good when we have in the presence of noise uh, for this, just for Aedes aegypti and Culex. I don't consider the, the the other species. It's around 81.7% uh, the average for the, the Gibbs sample because it's, it's the most lightweight mo model that, that we can use on board. The average is 81.7%. Uh, for these features, because this one is the best combined audio feature that... Yeah. Okay. We mix all 34 combinations and we find that this, one's com this combination is the best one. Uh, using the, C the CNN and this one, we, 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 we don't try yet because that one is a deep learning model. We, uh, we will test in, the, in, the, in these devices because this one has a more powerful uh, core. Yes. Yes, yes. We we already tested just to recognize our voice, yes or no, okay. and and work. So we can implement machine learning too, like uh, CVM, uh, CVM, and other uh, random forest algorithms too. But like 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 I said, if you use more robust machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms, the device will consume more. Yeah, so we so we update for the clustering because it's more. Yeah. Please. A little bit louder. Sorry, I don't, don't hear the second question. I don't. 
Yeah. Combine the, uh, the audio and also the... And he's, I think he's asking about if you are planning to combine the yeah. data with the, the audio. audio so. uh, no, no, no. Because for that, you, you will increase the cost of the system. To just to, to produce one of these devices, just one, is 110 euros. If you produce 100, it uh, drops to 65 euros. If you add a high-speed camera and, and other systems to uh, transmit the image, because to transmit the image, you need Wi-Fi at least, because we, you need more uh, uh, bandwidth. So it will, uh, will make the device more expensive. And the other question, we have one more. Yes, we have using the when we test the, in the first uh, in the Thailand uh, in the here we we find some uh, false positives. Mm -hmm. So we move for to uh, optical because when the mosquito pass, we know that this is mosquito. Let's start the garden. It's to save battery uh, and to have a more classification system, more robust classification. Okay. Thank you, Professor Vasconcelos. And uh, I think that's the end of our session. Let's uh, thank all the presenters and also the audience to be here. Okay. Over to you, or cough up to, up to half an hour? So you've been back by, yeah, 3.40. Okay.
So welcome back after the coffee break. Hope you are refreshed and warm welcome to our online audience. So I'm glad that we are gathered for the second and third session. So no, there is no coffee break between second and third session. And there will be a coffee break, of course, afterwards. So before I hand over to our chair, my colleague uh, Shams, Shams from IRVR, just to remind you, those of you who are interested in seeing the full program and the profiles of all speakers, there is a QR code in your brochure. So click this QR code and you can access this lovely program with everyone's uh, bios, photographs and the full detailed program. Thank you very much, Patty. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on digital interventions, COVID-19 and beyond. So it's an hour-long session that I'm going to chair. And I'm very pleased that we have five presentations in this uh, session. Some of them are group presentations. So I'm going to start with our first presentation, uh, which is a group presentation, it will be given by uh, Patty Koskova, uh, Aisha Aldisiri, and uh, Adrian Brown, who is a senior research fellow and lecturer in the Center of Obesity Research, University College London. And uh, he has got 16 years of clinical research experience. So we are very pleased to have these fantastic uh, presenters here who will be presenting the first talk on my activity journal app project supporting citizens during lockdown. So over to you. You have 10 minutes. And I think if you finish in time, then we have some questions uh, from the audience. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sam. So I'm back on in my, with my not chairing, with my uh, researchers had on. So it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce this project. Uh, and it will be a trio presentation with Adrian and Aisha. So my lockdown journal that we recently call my activity journal was actually started in March 2020 when we felt, well, we are a digital public health center. What can we do for people in lockdown? How can we support through our experience and our uh, digital skills what people are struggling with, you know, being locked down in their households, unable to carry on with their normal lives? So we thought, let's just develop an app to help people to journal their activity so they can record what they have been doing every day. Because if you remember, all the days felt the same. We were all locked in our bedrooms and Sundays looked the same as Monday. And uh, losing sense of time was one of the major things we have discovered was affecting people's well-being and, and mental health. So journaling is known to help people to keep track of their activities, be able to look at what they did various days, how much they enjoyed it. So we developed this little app by recomposing um, tools from other apps. So really quickly it was launched in a couple of months and allowing people to journal their activity and make quick notes about what they did, what they enjoy and um, keep some kind of track of time. So in this project I will present the beginning of this um, app uh, initiative and after the lockdown, we felt like actually people can continue using it because it is allowing to record activities. And it has shown, you will see it on my first slide, it has shown a lot of people actually took some sports activity and they actually got physically active during the lockdown. So we thought, well, let's work with people who actually are doing research with people living with obesity and see if this special uh, user group actually could also benefit from using the app if we develop it and customize it for their needs. So that's what you will see today. So the project, um, as I said, was launched in, uh, in April 2020. And to promote the app, we have uh, also launched a social media channel where people could be posting pictures of their activities, their journals, and we were awarding a weekly prize. So this was the first winner of the week in um, April 2020. So this girl has drawn this fantastic uh, journal and posted it on our channel. And we developed develop an API to be able to take these pictures and show them in the app to inspire people what could be done, what activities they can potentially take on while they're in lockdown. So this kind of social media competition and the app were combined and really boosted the usage of the app in the lockdown. 
as I said, the app has got a kind of a daily interface where you can enter what you've been doing, and this little fish at the top can tell you something positive. How good is journaling for you? Or how you need to have a break between your working time and your at home time while everything is at home. How good it is to close your laptop when you finish working and sit on the other side of your sofa for your afternoon. So lots of kind of activities developed by a colleague of ours who has a psychology background to help people get positive and motivated. So the activity could be um, chosen from uh, several categories, including sports, creative activities, uh, social activities, typically on Zoom. And people could then record how they're doing it online or offline and how much they're enjoying it. So we evaluated the usage of the app, and it's interesting to see that there was a massive spike, obviously, in the, in the first lockdown, when we were launching it and the whole thing was getting off the ground. Uh, then there was a little bit of a kind of a down, downtime, but then we did a lot of social media promotion. So in the second lockdown, we get the peak activity usage, and then there was a bit of a spike, and then slowly, after the third lockdown, the activity is still being used for people who enjoy this kind of um, journaling behavior, but it no longer kind of is fulfilling the purpose it had initially to help people who were stuck at home with a little sense of time and well-being. We also look at what activity people were recording using the app. So you can see uh, on, the, on the blue one, one of the most active was actually um, creative and sports. So people really was, were doing a lot of home-based activities, painting and, uh, and reading. They, some of them said they didn't do it before the lockdown, so they took new activities. Sports became really popular. A lot of people reported they were doing at least one day a week some kind of physical activity. And, um, and also, we have also noticed that people have been uh, doing a lot of online culture activities. They couldn't go to theatre, but they were watching theatres or operas online. So it was great to see how the activities have been uh, sort of creating and using throughout the various phases of the lockdown. And it was interesting to see that you know, act physical activity sport have been something which we didn't expect, but the app demonstrated has been really popular. So I hand over to Adrienne who will explain how we adopted this app after the lockdown for those living with obesity. Uh, thank you very much, Patty, and lovely to see everyone. It's great to be actually seeing faces um, as opposed to screens. Um, so uh, obviously, um, with any app, it, what's so important is we get the patient voice. Nothing about us without us. And therefore, what we decided to do is actually speak to people living with obesity to see how the app could actually be used with them. So what we decided to do is we got five patient advocates from groups around the country to actually share their experiences of actually using the app. So what we did, we had a three-phase approach. The first phase was an introduction. So myself, Patty and Aisha met and we introduced the app and we really asked people to have a think about how they might be able to use it. They then went away and they used it for a couple of weeks. And after they came back, they, they then fed back how they felt about it. What did it do? How were they using it? As you saw with the usage, yeah, some people are using it a lot, some people are. What meant that some people were actually using this a lot and other people weren't? And what we found that there was a variety of different opinions that came back. But one of the big ones was actually a lady that had chronic pain. And one of the experiences that she had, she said, I love journaling, but on the days that I can't do stuff, actually what I found was actually it was making me feel worse because I was wanting to do stuff, but I couldn't. And then the journal was saying, are you doing stuff? So it was actually quite interesting that actually we really need to think about when we are developing apps, when we're developing anything digital, that we speak to the people because these are things that maybe we wouldn't have thought of as, re as researchers, but until we actually spoke to the people living with obesity who might be able to use this app, that's when we came out. I'm now going to pass over to Aisha that then is now going to show you about what sort of changes we uh, brought through after the focus groups. Maybe the first thing we should mention is about the app. It was like the development of the app was so hard. <laughs> Although I'm a software engineer because it was for in the lockdown, the first lockdown for us as well. The first time to work as well from the screen. So we were shocked even we didn't know how to collaborate, how to work, how to communicate. So it was kind of challenging for all of us that the, 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 the app take about two months and then it's got to be launched. 
we were about five to six people, but it was quite challenging to get, especially that the app have a lot of features. So we, we have, we, we, with, the, with the people who are living with OBST, we use the same app, but it was like another version. We deployed, we more customized it to, to help these people. Again, as Adrian, I was second him in one point, it was very hard to estimate or like, I guess what they are, what, what kind of requirements they will need. It was so hard even from us. Like I can mention one thing, it's still like on top of my head mm. about when they ask us to move the activity list, Mm. The first activity list in the, uh, the first activity type on the list was sport, and they asked us to move the sport mm. from the top because it was quite challenging for them and make a, put a lot of pressure on them. Mm. So these things, I, as a programmer or an engineer, I would never think about it. So the focus group was really, really helpful for us. So one thing is about we develop in this app, which is like mainly the main feature is what about the notification system. So we build a notification system, but kind of like a smart notification system based on the historical data we have. So to not put a pressure on the people, we don't ask why you didn't do a sport today, or oh, you didn't journal anything today. No, the messages was, oh, like, we, we, we studied in how, like, we, we have the notification after three days or five days. All this was, like, not random notification. We put, we put like, requirements based on that. You notify based on the history, based on, based on the type of activity the person is recording. So the main thing we add to the app was the notification system, and we, 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 we the people was involved, so we, after this, after the system, we have another, I think the last focus group where they was they happy with it. And they also keep asking for more advanced in terms of the notification system. So then we, I think we realize the notification system in case if you are dealing with the people with living with the busy is very important. So we, this will be the hardest bit of the app, and you need an expert like like an Adrian so to help because no, nobody gonna. Think how it's work and how what's the expectation is so it's so hard it's so hard to assess by yourself so this is why you need an expert in the floor to help you to, with the developing as well so the second thing is was about the health data so we include part of the health data where they can it's part of the like I think it's part of the analysis related to the obesity so we need this calculation to be shown in the based on like some some measurement or some uh, data like they need to see it so they calculate that uh, the, the, uh, the AG and the fact it is, is like they do it and they input the data. This is the one of the features uh, that's also added to the app. So the main feature, I would say, is the notification system. It's, it, was very, it was very important. At the same time, it's very challenging to see exactly how to, make, to implement the system and let it work. So, yeah, is the, <laughs> that's it. So how many minutes do we have? <laughs> I think because we are three. Thank you so much. Thank you. How many minutes? Go. Yeah. Well, wonderfully, you kept it to time. So yeah. thank you so much, okay, Patty, Adrian, and Aisha, for this wonderful innovation, which has sustained. Uh, beyond lockdown, which was the main purpose. So that's the beauty of kind of digital innovations to keep people motivating. So with that, I'm going to go to the next presentation now. And uh, we have another group presentation. And I'm going to call on stage Lanley and Eva Sullivan to come here and, and, and talk about Zoom or not to Zoom. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks for your great presentation. I'm uh, actually, we are going to present uh, what we are colloquially referring to as to Zoom or not to Zoom, which is, uh, reference to a, a large study that we've been sort of parsing out over the last year or so, and is related to um, my lockdown journal, so uh, it's nice to follow such a fantastic group. My name's Ava Sullivan, and this is my uh, s fellow student and colleague, Lon Lee. Um, we're gonna try to keep this to 10 minutes and then give you guys a chance for five minutes of questions. 
Um, so to zoom or not to zoom is a longitudinal survey that we implemented over a, a key period of the COVID-19 pandemic starting in the early days. So uh, from the emergence of COVID in, in, in the winter of 2019, public health policy in the UK was intermittently mandating uh, restrictions in movement, in mask wearing, in gatherings, and then relaxing those restrictions. And over this period, a 15 month period, we were able to implement a longitudinal survey where we measured key components of people's experiences across this tumultuous time. Um, in the study, a series of online surveys were deployed to understand how people in the UK spent their time from January 2020 to October 2021. And this figure shows how we sort of conceptually broke up this time period um, into qualitative phases that relate to periods of extreme restriction and periods of more relaxed restriction. Uh, so we can see in phase one, this first blue arrow, this was really the commencement of that first dreaded lockdown in the UK, and then this tumultuous period uh, over the, the next 15 months. Um, our methods of data collection was an online survey um, through SurveyMonkey. Uh, we had, as you saw, these six phases based on, on um, UK public health policy at the time. Uh, the survey contained three major thematic sections, uh, really getting at who this population was, the demographics, um, what activities people were actually doing, um, and how they were accessing those activities, so whether or not they were doing online or in-person activities, and uh, measuring their positive or negative affect, so really understanding their moods and, uh, moods and emotions during the, uh, these periods. Um, we used a snowball sampling and recruitment through Facebook in order to get just as many uh, people as possible. Um, and again, that survey was administered over a 15-month period um, and represented some distinct points along the way. Um, as we moved through, uh, once we collected the data, uh, we sort of found a couple of thematic research areas that we uh, were, have been focused on uh, highlighting. The first paper that, um, that we pulled out of this data was really thinking about what activities people were doing and whether or not they were accessing them online or in person. Um, the second was thinking, uh, really diving deep into that PANAS score, which is positive and negative affect. That's related to people's moods and emotions over these periods. Um, the second thematic area that we sort of drew from our data was that of a, a particularly resilient uh, population that we identified, which is um, a population of older women um, that had a, a sort of a specific experience during um, this period that we were looking at. Um, and then qualitative analysis, which we haven't dove into yet and are looking forward to. We'll speak a little bit more on that later. Um, over to Lon to talk about some of the analysis. Yeah. So thanks to the engagement of all the participants, and we finally got more than 12,000 12, responses from 5,000 people. And to analyze the data, we cleaned and subsized to different um, parts and try, try to analyze the corresponding research questions. And you can see we, ha we have used a different um, study designs to analyze different questions. And a, ser a series of statistical tests were used to test the val validity and the reliability. And this project is still ongoing, so we're happy, but we ha we're happy to share some preliminary results here. So you can see, oh, throughout the whole period, um, the first question we try to, un try to know the activity changes in, in terms of the frequency and the mode. We can see the most affected activities are cultural activity, spending time with others, and traveling, which are mostly for social purposes. And um, we find for most of the activities, we, we try to analyze the frequency were mostly decreased in the during the first lockdown. 
and so that means people tr are almost kind of doing less activities than before the pandemic. And um, until the from the first first lockdown until the first lockdown ease, we find like people are more kind of shifting from in person to online. To, that is corresponding to the uh, policy um, measures, the, the, the public health measures. And from the the twenty July twenty twenty one until July until August twenty twenty one, that is after the Freedom Day in the in the UK. That <laughs> the the government say all the public measures is kind of um, abolished. So at that time, we find there are less. But we, that's interestingly, like we find people are still doing less cultural and group activities than before the pandemic. We compare this before we compare that period with the. Um, before the pandemic, we find people are kind of retaining what they have done during the lockdown event. And uh, we, we also find during that period, more than half of people spending time with others and shopping and work and study still online or in a hybrid way. So we can see the lockdown has really changed people's lifestyle. And in terms of the second qu research question about emotions, we find uh, Gender, age, and employment status are the are the most significant uh, factors which are have the impact on the people's emotion status. And the people who are older or uh, retired and uh, women women are generally feeling more positive than the other parts. And we try to identif identify the hot times uh, when people are feeling most negative or most positive. And we find during the second lockdown, people are mostly feeling like most negative, which is understandable. People don't want to have another lockdown again. And uh, after the Freedom Day, that is the most positive, which is also understandable. And um, for the old female, the subsets, the subsets we give a special eye on, we find the change of social activity is similar to the whole cohort. They were, these are the most affected activities as well. And, uh, but the difference would be uh, here, we find a more clear, a, a much more clear a pattern. We find there is a decrease in the beginning, but there is an increase after the, uh, uh, since the, the third lockdown, the earlier 2021. And uh, for the emotion change in, in, within this group of people, we find they are most posit more positive um, during the first lockdown ease, but most negative <laughs> just after the ease when the second lockdown starts. And they are most happy um, after the Freedom Day. So that is kind of understandable. And we also try to find out from our data what makes this kind of things happen. We try to explore which are the significant factors. And we find, um, we try to find a correlation between activities and the emotions, whether this kind of activity, activity would be helpful to help them keeping happy or not. And we find that the, the more, frequency, more, fre more frequent social media use is correlated with higher negative feelings, even within this group of people. And getting active is is associated with higher positive feelings. So that is also understandable. So that's what we have um, got now. And we have already published our first paper about the activities. So if anyone um, ha have interest in it, you can probably go to look at the paper. And then, yeah, over to Ava. Thanks, Lan. I'm just returning to speak a little bit about future work and possible applications. Um, like I said, we are, there's some um, write-in answers that we had on our survey. Um, these short answers um, allow us to dive a little bit deeper and get more context to the statistical analysis we were able to do with the quantitative survey. So I think it's easy with some of this data to anecdotally kind of tell a story in your head. Well, they're happier because they're uh, working out and that's what I like to do during lockdown. But to really dive deep into some of the qualitative um, data that we collected will be important to understand context. Um, I also think it'll be important for us to identify sort of 
what makes people resilient um, it, 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 during a lockdown like this or particularly vulnerable um, to perhaps uh, negative emotions or uh, ending um, activities that they previously did um, and to actually apply that to perhaps uh, different um, disasters or scenarios. Um, I'm going to stop there because I think we're out of time. But uh, thank you so much to the entire uh, DPAG team, particularly Patty. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Len and uh, Eva, for your presentation. If you stay here for a moment, I know I missed in the last uh, presentation, I forgot to ask. Actually, um, we have a bit of time now because you guys covered it very nicely and uh, well in time. So can we spend five minutes now and get a few questions from the audience? So I'm going to start with you two first. And then if we have from the audience any questions from, for Patty, Aisha, and Adrian, then we go back to the first presentation. So first question, sir. Hi. Um, thank you very much. Uh, very good uh, presentation. It's very interesting, use and, and congratulations on that. I just wondered, I imagine it's in your published paper now, but any, what can you say about biases in the sample? Because we know that online is not for everybody. It excludes quite a lot of people, obviously sort of young kids, but you know, elderly people and people with disabilities. And to what extent you can extend that to sort of broader population because what strikes me is that you were dealing with people who were forced to lock down but you have to remember that not everybody could be constrained at home and certainly not everybody could work from home. The biggest figure I've, I've found, the largest figure I've found for London for example, the height of lockdown, is that um, only 43% of us, and it includes most of us, were able to work from home, which means 57% could not work from home. Um, that includes quite a lot of people. So, to what extent that is put into a broader context? Yeah, definitely. We, we yeah, there is a, a, some bias because we are using online survey tools, so we can only approach to the people who are like they are uh, com feel comfortable to using laptop or um, the stuff. And also, because in our sample, we got more like as, as we said, we got more elder people and also the female people and also they are mo mostly higher educated so that is the, also the reason why we also give a special eye on this group of people although in the we, when we analyze the whole subs, the whole uh, population we use some statistical methods try to bias the sample but still we felt it will be better to only look this this sub size because we that is what we collected and yeah i think that's that's what we have done to um, try to bias the sample and to, uh, try to help to um, give the accurate um, results from the sample, yeah. I also think it underscores the importance of that qualitative element. So really getting into the rich, detailed context of the respondent's individual experience and understanding what that is and highlighting that as a qualitative result um, that's not perhaps able to be broadly applied, um, but raising it up as something that allowed people to either um, continue doing a certain activities or, uh, you know, giving, giving that context to their experience. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. I don't please. know if I missed that. Uh, did you specify what is the uh, threshold for old females? Uh, how do you classify it? Yeah, we set a threshold as 55 plus. Is it a standard class classification? For it's people? not a standard. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, based on our sample, yeah. yeah. So, because you probably, is, uh, usually we, we try to get some uh, standard from other uh, instruments. Yeah. Or probably if there, there are some, some of uh, uh, similar surveys that are doing exactly that in terms of age, like classifications or layers. Uh, so uh, I would say it's probably better to to uh, define that in like uh, the standard way. So, uh, but uh, probably there, there there is a uh, like 
threshold, the standard threshold? So I think the standard for most surveys is 65. Where we, oh, okay. where we, um, or at least in, um, in, in the United States context, I know that 65 is usually a marker. Um, why we wanted to broaden it out a little bit was because it captured such an outsized proportion of the sample size that we got. So I think you're correct in pointing out that we need to sort of tailor the language to really describe who, what population we're speaking about. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one more minute. So is there any question for the activity journal presentation that was presented by Patty, Aisha, and uh, do we have Adrian here? Uh, Lisa, you have a question. Okay. I wondered if you had any plans to assess to what degree um, the activities have been maintained um, since the restrictions have eased. Could you please repeat? Um, so my question is, um, have, have you decided that you are you going to do any follow up to assess the degree to which um, some of these activities, like particular physical activities, have been maintained since the restriction, since the easing of the restrictions? And also, have you considered using other types of methods? So you mentioned about the lady with pain, but have you considered maybe including things like voice activation so people could actually speak into the app and it records their thoughts rather than actually having to sort of type? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Very good question. Um, I think that's kind of the fundamental uh, behavior change question. Like, if people change their behavior to do something new, how long are they going to continue doing it? So, yes, the app has got this data collected because we have got people registered with their profile. So, we are looking into analyzing these detailed questions to see how long they have remained uh, being physically active or whatever um, group of activities they have recorded as, as doing as new. Um, in terms of the question about the voice, it hasn't been implemented in the current version, but that's a very good idea. That's something we will consider for the next versions. Thank you. As a chair, I would like to ask you a question. Go for it. I you, have have the right, you have the right to ask I a question. I have observed from the time series graph that you presented, sports was one of the top activities during the kind of lockdown situation. And then as we moved away from the lockdown towards the kind of end of the time series, if you like, that dropped quite dramatically. But then in contrast, there is something called creative that kind of reversed the trend and it kept going upward. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit? Do you want to read this question? I, I think the first phase of the lockdown, because I'm speaking from the UK, because most of the, our users were the UK, uh, based in UK. So if you remember the rules of the, like you cannot, you have to stay at home apart from the sport. So some people, I think this is the only way to go out. So it was go, <laughs> this is me as well. This is how I start to do sport. So during the lockdown, we start running, we start walking, we start to do this stuff. And then, and plus uh, the creative thing was uh, really is including painting, also cooking was nice. under, the, under the creative things. So I think the people who never practice some activities, during the lockdown they got the chance to find their hobbies or skills, they, dis they, ex they discover themselves properly. Yeah. And then sport, I don't know. This is like, I mean, yeah. you need a behavior uh, expert, <laughs> why the change is happening. Like, it's, it's, to it's, me, it was quite fascinating to see yes. the trend. So I just have one, one, one more question regarding this. The sport also included walking. So a lot of yes. people recorded yes. they went out for the one opportunity to leave the home during the first lockdown and went walking. And just, just as a bit of a joke, we also have seen people, we kind of link this data with the Zoom or Not to Zoom study, where we collected more qualitative uh, also answers. People also recorded they were walking dogs a lot. So it was <laughs> popular to have, a, to have a pet, have a dog, because you have an excuse to actually go for more than one walk because you have to walk your dog. So I think you know this explains why sports as a big category were so popular in the first lockdown. And then the cooking, as I Aisha said, which sure. was part of the, uh, the creative activity, exactly. remain perhaps more popular yes. after the restrictions eased. Yes. I think, just to add, I think the, the whole lockdown was in a way revealing for many. People became all of a sudden quite creative because they, they had this kind of hidden Time. creativities Time. that they get to practice during the lockdown and then they kind of 
uh, kept on going and become more, more creative. Excellent. So thank you very much for, for the two presentations. In the interest of time, so yes, uh, good round of applause. In the interest of time, let's move on to the next presentation, uh, which is a group presentation, but I understand the first speaker, uh, Pedro Campos, is not with us here. Yes. So that we, um, we so we have the second uh, presenter here, uh, Miguel Ribeiro, uh, will be presenting Madeira Safe App. So you have 15 minutes, including five minutes for questions. So, hi, I'm Miguel Ribeiro, I'm based from Madeira, and I'll be presenting the IT solution that we implemented for the COVID-19. It was called Madeira Safe to Discover, and in particular, the Madeira Safe uh, mobile app. So it was aimed to track and to detect the cases of COVID-19, and uh, to guarantee the safety in the community. And it interacted on a daily basis, the mobile app interacted on a daily basis with its users by asking questions about their health conditions, their symptoms, and keeping track of, uh, of their, their conditions. It also acted as a filter in the, for, the, for the region, because it's, a, it's an island, it's a sort of a special case, because the entrance points of the, of the island are the ports with the, the cruise ships and the airport. So the cruise ships stopped working because th there weren't any cruise ships during lockdown, and we had a special case to control the airport, which was the only point of interest for the disease in, in the island. Uh, <clears throat> It, it had several components, so Madeira Safety Score had several components. It had the web app for the citizens, it had the fast checkout for the health authorities that helped the citizens to uh, pr process the checkout at the airports and do the COVID test and register the, their information on the, on the system. It had the dashboards also for, uh, not only for the citizens, but also for the health authorities. And it had a passive Wi-Fi monitoring, which, is our, which was already implemented prior to, the, to, to COVID, and it was repurposed on the mobile app by displaying that, uh, that information. So the app, the main purpose was the app. It was made on a gamification aspect. It started on the research group at the university, and then it moved on to, to a private company to, for the implementation. Of the, of, uh, of the app because it wasn't the purpose of the, the university to make a commercial use uh, out of that. The app did not focus on contact tracing. There, there was a lot of uh, apps during, for that and there, there was already a national app for that. But it wasn't, somewhere, it wasn't that well received by the citizens because of the data privacy and uh, those sort of concerns. So it is more focused on being an informative app and uh, helping the citizens to use safe locations. We started with some use cases where a, fam a family, for instance, uh, plans their holidays. They arrive at the island, they are uh, instigated to use the app and to give their information. And then they, uh, throughout the, the, the first days, if they tested positive or, or not, they are still prompted by push notifications to provide their symptoms and uh, provide their, their health status, basically. On the daily use of a family, it could be used to, to check, for instance, the least uh, uh, Occup occupancy, the, the locations that had at least occupancy, and it, this was uh, based on the passive Wi-Fi infrastructure that gave an occupation rating for different locations, and you, you could see that on the map. This is another case for, for the daily family, where you could meet uh, your friends or visit coffees or uh, shopping centers for on the least used hours. And also for the, for the risk groups and the elderly, like going to the pharmacy, going to the supermarkets, and you could check like, uh, the popular times where a location was used based on the, the Wi-Fi data. So this was the landing page for Madeira Safety Discover, where it was promoted and the branding was done. And then the component, there was an, an, a web app component, which the users had the possibility to check the results of the COVID tests. So this was used from the, also for, by the health authorities. And um, the, uh, the, the results were also sent via SMS to the, to the users, and the users could re also report how they feel, check their COVID tests, submit documents uh, regarding um, uh, recovery, uh, COVID rec uh, recovery uh, from prior to, to their uh, country of origin. 
Also for the health authorities, we, the, this was private and it had, they had the dashboards to check all kinds of statistics, not only from the visitors at the airport, but also from the local cases that existed throughout the island, also with maps. The Wi-Fi data was a special case, like I said, it was uh, already in use prior to the COVID and it was repurposed via a dashboard where we, we could see the popular times and the different locations and then clicking on a location we could see the current hour and we could see the daily history of that location. Clicking on a day we could see the, the hourly history, much like it was shown before. You could see also and report uh, if you know how many people you could ask, you could report back to the system how many people you think it was on that, that location. There was also a, a, a widget that the, some locations could include on their websites to report the, the occupation of, of that location for the users of, of those systems. So the, the mobile app started, when we installed the mobile app, it started with instructions then the permission to show uh, push notifications and the geolocation. The geolocation was not used to track people, it was just used for the map to navigate to the, to sa the safe locations. And the authorization for the, um, for the login, if you already had the login from the airport, if you registered. Then it had several, uh, several uh, screens. You could have the experiences that it gives the, the user like an overview of the current points that they collected. So this was the gamif gamification part, where if you visit safe locations that were marked as safe by the health authorities and by the app, you would get points. And then you could trade those points by experiences. And it would rec the app would also recommend safe locations. For instance, we have the botanical garden there. And it you could check the, uh, the, the affluent, uh, the hours of affluence. And it would also give you the, the health recommendations before you before you start planning your, your trip. So you could obtain points by registering the app, by submitting a COVID test, by activating push notifications, sharing app on social media, using the app daily, daily for one point per day, and informing the, the health systems. Then we had different kind of, kinds of experiences. You have the basic silver and gold that would attribute several points that could then be traded for coupons or discounts on stores or other experiences as well where you had to pay and you would, you would have the, the discounts. On planning the trip, you, you, we had the map where you could see the safe locations marked in green. Then we had, the, again, the health recommendations and the, the, daily, the hourly ratings. This is the component where you would submit your health status. So, Every day, the app, if you had a, 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 a positive COVID test, every day the app would prompt you to submit your symptoms and your body temperature and uh, uh, your, your health status, basically. So, on general, over 1.4 million users have used the app with an average of 1,800 uh, daily new users. Between, this was between January 1st, uh, 2021 and April 30th, 2022. Uh, over 1 million flights were registered on the system. Uh, the flight started before the, the, the app was actually implemented, so it started on 2020, and the app was only implemented in 2021. That's why we have so many flights, as ma almost as many flights as, as, as visitors. Uh, over 500,000 lab tests were submitted to the system, while others were not, not all tests were lab tests, some were later on they were done with the, the quick tests and not PCR. This was after mid-2021. Uh, and there were also a million submitted documents by the visitors on the web app that it could also be issued over 19,000 19, recovery, recovery certificates. There was also a survey that was sent to the visitors after they completed the, the visit. And it was, done, it was sent by via email and the most answers were gathered in English and Portuguese, and some of the questions include uh, if, if the app was useful for dealing with the documentation and if the platform, if the platform make you, made you feel safer overall, with the resounding yes. Some other questions were which, which, well, which was the, the app more useful? It was useful for submitting documents in advance to get the COVID test results for a faster checkout process at the airport and having the the information centralized in one location. 
there were more questions, but I'll just uh, put this one more. If, uh, if the users would like to have a similar system in other uh, destinations, and uh, over 80% over said uh, between four and five, uh, much, very, very much, and, 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 uh, and this is it. If you're interested in the passive Wi-Fi system, I can give you more information about that because it was my master thesis. And currently, since April this year, because the COVID tests were no longer mandatory at the airport and the masks were dropped, the public part of the system, so the mobile app and the web app, are not, no longer being used by the citizens. But the, the, the back end for the authorities are still being used because there are still COVID tests being done and uh, results are being submitted and sent to the people as well. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, for, the, for your presentation. We have a couple of minutes uh, for any questions from the audience for Miguel. Any questions? Uh, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. Uh, I was wondering, um, what was the uh, where all I mean, where all these data uh, stored? Um, was it in uh, some databases that uh, the, that the NGO had, or was it the infrastructure of the pri uh, private provider of the application? It was the infrastructure of the private provider. So it was done by that company, C Health. They implemented the the system and provided the data to the health authorities. Uh, following the general guidelines of GDPR and data protection. Okay, thank you. Good question and clear answer. Next question. Well, it's, uh, it's also a question about the private company. Uh, how was the uh, arrangement with the university and government for they hired the, the, the company by using government money? Yes. For, for the solution that was conceived by the university? It, it started in the university in conjunction with the health authorities and because the university wouldn't be suitable to make a commercial version, it, it couldn't be, it would, I mean the university is non-profit, it couldn't uh, make, uh, make that as a commercial version of that. So they created a company and uh, the government funded the company to, to implement the, the whole solution. So it was ju not just the app, it was the, the, the back end the SMS system, the push notifications, the, the uh, help at the airport to do the fast checkout. It was a, a whole solution. That why, that's why it was Madeira Safe to discover and Madeira Safe was just the app. Okay. But you have access to the data for studies and or? We have the statistical data. Okay. Because we were working in conjunction with the health authorities and the, the Sea Health company. You have you have approval for, for doing research on this data? Yes, yes, yes. We don't, we anonymize data, we just, we, we don't have, we don't target <laughs> people, just okay. the, the statistics. Sure. Thank, okay. you. Thank you, thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's move on to the next presentation, which will be given by Bob Spence, um, who is an emeritus professor of information engineering at Imperial College London and a specialist in interactive graphic design. So Bob is going to present the impact of the images. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, if you can't hear me, make the usual gesture. I used to ask if people could hear me. My colleague did that once and got the answer, I can, but I'll change places with anybody who can't. <laughs> no mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, numbers. They are the gold dust that we have to communicate to the public. 
And to do so, we've got to place them in the context of words. And a lot of work is involved in doing that. A lot of thinking, as anybody who's written a journal paper will know. But out there around the world, there's a lot of people who have to understand your message. And they also can be faced with a huge amount of cognitive effort. An alternative which can vastly reduce the amount of effort that those people have got to uh, engage in is to represent those numbers as an image that can offer an immediacy of understanding much more usually than a text message can achieve. There are plenty of examples, uh, Florence Nightingale and uh, Dr. John Snow of cholera fame. That was more than a hundred years ago. What I want to do today is to show you two examples to illustrate the huge potential of the visual representation of data. Here's my first example. During the early stages of COVID, the BBC every evening reported on how many people had died of COVID in the last 24 hours. And it was a large number. I was obviously saddened by that, but also confused. I thought there was a message that hadn't been put forward by the BBC. But then I found tucked away on an inside page of the Times the usual collection of words and numbers. I read that message very, very carefully and again very, very carefully and transformed those, that message into an image. COVID deaths over the six months, January to June 2020. What I did not realize, and the BBC did not tell me, that most of those people were completely unvaccinated. Or they were, had one jab less than a few days beforehand. Okay, that, that sort of hit me. And then I looked at the top left, that little red bit. They, in those days, they kept emphasizing uh, the danger to the elderly, a group to which I reluctantly belong. But if we look at that red area, those are the people who are medically fit and they've had two jabs and for, for, uh, two jabs, that's right, sorry. And if we look at that area, it amounts to 20 deaths per month, which is less than one a day. If you were elderly, and you had medical problems, you're one of the green group, just below, slightly over one a day. I found that diagram extremely interesting, to put it mildly. So there's an example where an image can convey 
immediately or very quickly a message that is difficult to get across in numbers and words. My second example comes from NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. In the form of the launch of the Challenger, which unfortunately was named the shuttle as if it did hourly flights between Boston and New York. What happened, of course, in 1986 was that, that, uh, that uh, journey <laughs> came to a halt after about a minute, I think and caused the deaths of seven astronauts. Right. To see how the... Uh, sorry. Uh, the, on the day before the launch... Okay. They knew it was going to be cold outside the next morning. They also knew that low temperatures affect the behavior of what's called an O-ring. And they had to decide, should we launch? And as we all know, the wrong decision was made argu arguably for political reasons. Okay, to see how the visual representation of data comes into this story. Let's look at the investigation that followed that disaster and which examined the known data about O-ring failures. Known data. A company associated with NASA encapsulated that data in this diagram, which I'm still trying to figure out and have simply lost the will to do so. The data is all there. But somebody else suggested an alternative representation of that data. They plotted a measure of the severity of the O-ring damage against the outside temperature, which in Florida can go as high as 90 and beyond. Okay, there were many launches where there was no O-ring disaster, uh, uh, failure. There was a problem at 75 degrees Fahrenheit and two more, just as severe as we go down to about 70. And under 65, there was always some damage. Okay. Some at 40, 64 degrees, more damage at 59 degrees, and even more at 54 degrees. That is all the data about the O-ring damage. So the question you're answering, uh, asking is, how cold was it the following morning, the morning of the launch? And the answer is right there. If I'd been an astronaut, and seen that plot, I think I would have waited for the next bus, so to speak. Okay, simple visual representation of data. And seven astronauts died because somebody didn't take the data and represent it visually in the right way. Now, I'll admit that the construction of a visual representation 
takes a lot of work. So just writing words around numbers. And it's a lot of work if you've got a multi-dimensional set of figures. This is very simple. So all I can do is to uh, support the view of a guy called Martin Krasinski, who simply said, good visual explanations inform us in a pandemic they could save us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fine. Spence, for your excellent, uh, fascinating pr presentation of, on the, uh, the strength, the power of image, if you like. So a good map speaks. We have a, we have a minute yes, for you to see if there are any questions from the audience. Thank you. Any questions for Bob? Yes, please. Uh, I understand that. Uh, oh, thank you. I understand that the the power of the the graph is like uh, wonderful, but I see that the. Uh, gradual presentation of details, unveiling the details slowly, gives us the effect of, you know, discovering things during the presentation. Yeah. So I think it's not only the image itself, but also the animation. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> will you think how, how this could be uh, in terms of, uh, for the general public, and how this could be uh, like achieved the same effect achieved using like uh, I don't know multi multimedia or have, have I got an hour? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a minute. One minute. I'm afraid. One, minute, one hour and one minute. Yeah, uh, let's meet over coffee. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the presentation was wonderfully. Placed and uh, it had the climax in it. Oh, Patty, you have. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I was just asking when you started with the BBC and the data presented on COVID cases, have you approached the BBC to inform them they could do a better job? I tried. try to uh, send a message to a journalist. Who's the guy who was always on BBC News? Sorry. Is there a microphone? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, there's a guy whose name I've forgotten. He was always on the evening news talking about COVID and its effect. Uh, I could not find his email address. I couldn't find any way of communicating with him. I, I, I had a lot to say to him. <laughs> maybe, maybe a tweet. Maybe he has a Twitter account. I don't do <laughs> tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you in, so in much. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can hold on to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank Thank you so just, much. Just like I don't do one more. That's all the time we have. Uh, so I give round applause to you. So in the interest of time, let's move on to the last presentation of this session. And this will be given by Dr. Lisa Dankwa. Where is Lisa? Okay, <laughs> you are there. So Lisa will be talking to us about evaluating digital health interventions for contact tracing in Sierra Leone. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Shams. So I'm coming from a rather, um, I'll just lower this bit. I'm coming from a rather different perspective, um, but really still on the theme of emerging infectious diseases. So I'm going to talk to you today about improving Ebola contact tracing in Northern Sierra Leone and demonstrating a proof of concept study in the lessons learned during a humanitarian emergency. 
So just to give you some background, I spent nine months in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, and I was working in the second worst affected district. So I'm going to um, talk to you today about the study that we, um, we implemented there that changed design and what some of the um, key considerations actually were. So although the focus of this session is on COVID-19 and beyond, I'm coming at it from a different perspective in terms of should we be learning from previous emerging infectious disease outbreaks? We've heard today a lot of people talking about contact tracing, a lot of this sort of the issues in terms of implementing digital technologies during outbreaks. So really, have we actually learned lessons? So first of all, I'm going to provide you with an overview. Um, so the Ebola contact tracing study was a collaboration between the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine just down the road where I used to work, Innovations for Poverty Action and International Medical Corps. And it was conducted in 2015 in the Port Loco district of Northern Sierra Leone. So really, the key focus of this study was really to assess some of the kind of key constraints that were um, apparent with the contact tracing system. So just to give you some context, that during the um, Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, the national system that was being used was um, sorry, the national system that was being used was a paper-based system. Um, and so that was being used throughout the whole country. And we identified that there were several issues with using this type of system. Sorry, I'm not a microphone person. There were several, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. there were several issues with using this type of system. Um, so for example, incomplete contact lists, um, paper um, contact forms getting lost, etc., and key issues um, in terms of contact tracing in rural areas. So as you all know, you've heard a lot about contact tracing. It's essential to limit the onward transmission um, of Ebola virus disease. And contact tracing has been used for several different emerging infectious diseases. I'm sure obviously we all know about um, COVID-19. And in, t in the context of Ebola, it's been successfully used um, to to, um, during previous outbreaks, but a number of challenges exist, as I've mentioned previously. So really, the aim of our study was really to describe the feasibility and the effectiveness of an electronic data capture and management system, the Ebola contact tracing app, to improve the monitoring of contacts of confirmed Ebola cases with Ebola in a Port Loco district. And really, it wasn't only to um, assess the feasibility and effectiveness, but also to provide detailed guidance on how we could best implement this system. And our particular study objectives were really to evaluate the effectiveness of a state-of-the-art mobile technology to improve the time between a new Ebola case being laboratory confirmed um, to their household contacts first being visited by a contact tracer, and then to really assess what was needed operationally to actually introduce effective mobile-based contact tracing and monitoring in Sierra Leone, which wasn't actually being done. So as I said, our original design was a cluster randomised trial. It was a two-arm trial, so we had the um, intervention arm where the contact tracing coordinators and the contact tracers were given the Ebola contact tracing um, app, and then there was the, um, the control arm where the standard paper-based system was being used. So we allocated the 11 chiefdoms in Port Loco in a 5-6 allocation ratio. So five were allocated to the intervention and six were allocated to the control. And our primary outcome measure was really the time from the confirmation of the Ebola case to the first contact with the actual um, Ebola contact. And we got that time from Public Health England who were doing laboratory testing in the district. So this was the original design. As I said, there are 11 chiefdoms. They're either randomised to receive the intervention, which was the Ebola contact tracing app, or the actual um, the standard system that was being used, the control arm, where um, the paper-based system was being used. As I said, the contact tracing coordinators who were responsible for contact tracers um, were provided with a smartphone installed with the actual app. And in the comparison arm, the contact tracing coordinators and contact tracers in that comparison arm continue to use the standard system. Well, this all seems sort of very nice and lovely. This is the intervention. So this is the actual Ebola contact tracing app. And it was a free tier system. So the first stage was a registration stage where the Ebola case and the contacts were registered. The second stage was the assignment stage, and that was primarily for the contact tracing coordinators, who were there were 23 at the time. And then the third stage was the contact tracers, who actually did the visitation of the Ebola contact, and there were 86 of those. However, I've presented to you quite a nice design, but we were obviously working on this during a humanitarian emergency. Things didn't go to plan, the Ebola cases began to decline, and all of the actual Ebola cases and their contacts were occurring in the control arm. So everything was being monitored with paper. So this process continued all the way up until June. 
and I highlighted this to the principal investigators. I said, you know, if we continue with this strategy, we will not be able to sort of demonstrate the use of the app. So we had to rapidly change our design from a contact a cluster randomized trial to a proof of concept study, really to try and demonstrate the actual use of the app. So then we scaled up to all of the 11 chiefdoms in Port Loco um, so that we could monitor all Ebola cases and contacts with the actual app. And this was the sort of modified design. So once the Ebola um, virus disease case was confirmed by the lab, the district health management team would line list, um, th there would be a line listing of the actual um, contacts of that case. The contact tracing coordinator um, would then assign the contacts of that Ebola case to the relevant contact tracer in the particular chiefdom. So I know I've gone through that quite quickly, but I think it's important to give you context so that you understand the actual findings. So from um, the study period, which was from the 13th of April to the 31st of August, um, there were 43 Ebola cases. 25 of those cases were monitored with the paper-based system because they were the ones that occurred in the control arm when it was originally a cluster randomized trial. The other 18 were monitored using the ECT app. And these um, were, the paper-based ones were mainly distributed across two chiefdoms and the app-based ones were distributed across five chiefdoms. So all in all, there are 1,055 contacts that were, that were identified from the 43 cases. 408 of those were from the paper-based and 647 were from the app and they were similar in terms of age and gender. And what we really wanted to do was to estimate the duration from laboratory confirmation of an Ebola case to the time in which the actual contact tracer first visited them with the app. And then we also estimated the median durations between each of these different steps. In the interest of time, I'm going to present to you the main results. Um, so for the 18 base app cases, um, there were 556 contacts um, that were registered on the um, that were registered in total, and 384 were monitored using the app. We found um, the median time from actual case registration to first contact visit was actually much longer than we actually expected. So that was nearly 70.2 hours. But the other durations of the app, for example, registering the Ebola case um, to the information then going to the district was much shorter. Only nine of the 25 paper-based cases had returned forms. So really what I want to highlight to you here is the challenges of actually using paper during, um, during an, like a, any type of sort of outbreak. You know, forms weren't being returned. When they were being returned, they were of poor quality. We couldn't read the information that was on them. Um, also, 63 of the 157 forms, so that's just over 40%, had a contact time, visit time reported before the laboratory confirmation time. So it wasn't even realistic that those results were actually true. And of the 94 contact forms that we had available, although there was a shorter median time from the laboratory confirmation to the first contact, we couldn't actually believe those results because a lot of forms said, oh, you know, I arrived at the contact's house at 8.30, when they should actually have been, the people who were responsible for contact tracing should have been actually at the district collecting the forms that day. So we knew that that information wasn't actually true. So just to summarize, our key findings were that we were unable to test our original trial hypothesis so the app would be more effective. The duration was much longer, but it was one of the first studies to attempt to estimate the time to first contact from laboratory information to first contact visit. We were able to demonstrate proof of concept, but there were a number of technical challenges. The app, however, did have improved data quality and accuracy over the paper-based approach. How, how long do I have left? Um, okay, and so some of the lessons learned were achieving the desired sample size, we had to change our design. Working in a rapidly changing situation, we had to mirror the the kind of the structural design of the paper-based app in the actual um, app, and it was, it was difficult to do. And then we also faced challenges from the WHO and other technical partners about actually bringing in intervention during a um, humanitarian emergency. So yeah, there are key challenges in designing and developing and implementing an app during a, um, an epidemic. Um, and despite these, we were able to demonstrate proof of concept, but having more time, um, to develop and test the app in a non-emergency setting would have been helpful. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, very much Lisa, for uh, presenting the case study on Ebola. We have a minute for you before we wrap up. Any quick questions, please? All right, thank you very much. 
Yeah, you have a nice presentation, but I want to have a question. I have a question for you regarding data collection because I saw where you a slide where you talked about you know improved data collection, completeness, and all of that. And I know that in Africa generally, data collection is a problem because they've got no records of data. So how are you able to cope with that? Like, how are you able to cope with that? Like how are you able to get your data? Data ethics, or? yeah, um, like accurate data. That, like, that like, so basically, the standard process, as I said during the time, was the actual paper-based system. This is what was being implemented across Sevilleo. So, okay. if there were a hundred contacts or one Ebola case, contact tracers would go with a hundred um, pieces of paper. So, there were key challenges challenges with that. But what we were able to do is, once the Ebola case was actually confirmed, we would use that line list and we would actually. Um, register the Ebola case and contact in our system, and we were able to actually follow up more contacts than the paper-based system itself. So I'm not trying to argue with you that there aren't challenges in terms of um, data collection. Yes, there are, but using paper during an outbreak has some particular challenges, and we were able to have more improved data quality and completeness compared to the paper-based data. We have a paper on this that explains the findings. Um, oh, OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anwar, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, your presentation is really cool. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about, uh, so you calculated like the, uh, so like the time as uh, uh, like case registration as, because you use, you use an, a CRT, right? Don't you think like, another estimate like efficacy would have been a much more appropriate measure to kind of measure well, efficiency or see, we, we were really trying to estimate does actually using a, like a, an app based system improve the actual time in which contacts can be um, monitored it's it's critical to be able to um, identify contacts quickly so we used our our primary outcome measure was actually the time in which the Ebola case was confirmed by Public Health England. So this wasn't a statistic we were just picking out of the sky. To the time in which the app recorded the contact tracer first visit in the household. There were other key performance indicators, but really we were interested in the actual time compared with that of the actual paper-based system. So we asked contact tracers who were using the paper-based system to record the time in which they got to the house. But as I mentioned to you, they were making up the time in most of the instances. But our app was able to accurately estimate the laboratory time, because we got that from Public Health England, and the time in which the person physically reached on the ground, which the paper-based system wasn't able to do. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, just one, Thanks. really one quick question. <laughs> okay. Very quick question, <laughs> really, one really last quick. question, very quick. Okay, so you're able to generate all this data. So have you guys analyzed it beyond? So this contact tracing data set in these cases and people, you should be able to generate some kind of network from that. So have you guys thought of doing some kind of network analyses and harnessing that? Yeah, so the, tr the study was actually quite a short study. So obviously it was a rapid study that we conducted during the Ebola outbreak. So the fir for the purposes of our study, we were focused on, you know, uh, assessing our, our outcomes. So we haven't done any social network analysis and the study has kind of, you know, everybody's gone their own separate ways. I've continued to look at this in my own sort of, you know, personal time. So that would be something interesting to do, but it wasn't within the scope of our work. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Anwar, for the question. So we are at the end of time for this session. I would like to thank all the presenters for their excellent presentations and also the audience, very engaged audience, for the questions and the discussions. So give all the presenters a big round of applause. Over to you, Patty. So just to um, reiterate, thank you so much, Shams. It was great sharing and really engaging and active session. So as I mentioned, we, ha we have only three talks, so there is no coffee break between the second and the third session. And there will be a coffee break afterwards before the panel, and then will be the reception. So you have 
plenty to look forward to. So this is just a time to introduce our final session chair, Dr. Zemti Engin from Computer Science Department will be chairing the session on the environmental and cultural factors for One Health. Over to thank you. you, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really uh, very pleased to be here today, so thank you for the invitation, Patty. Um, so it is the session on environmental and cultural factors in One Health surveillance. We have got three presentations, but four speakers. I'm aware that, uh, well, it's been a long session, the previous one, so I would encourage some movement uh, until our next speaker comes to the stage. Um, so, introducing first speaker, but maybe before that, I was asked to remind uh, everyone, and first to my speakers, to speak into the microphone, and at the end of the session, there will be Q&A, uh, and for Q&A, I'll ask, um, or the audience to wait for the microphone again before uh, to ask their questions. So, first speaker, um, Anna Sullivan from Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies at UCL and EcoHealth Alliance in USA. So, please, stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. You all uh, know me from the previous session, um, but my name is Ava Sullivan. I'm actually, I'm a, a, need I speak more into the mic? Can you guys hear me well? Okay. Um, I, I just want to introduce myself for context of sort of how I'm speaking to this topic today. I'm a part-time first-year PhD student. So this is really a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's something that I'm interested in diving into deeper. I won't be presenting um, sort of project results, but rather speaking around this topic as it relates to the theme of this session and the theme of, of the entire day. So One Health in the Era of Global Warming, I really want to speak to um, my interest in anthropogenic activities as it relates to spillover risk and really thinking about how that modifies uh, surveillance opportunities. Uh, so I will also say that a lot of this work uh, is influenced by uh, researchers that are in this room today. So it's very exciting to um, speak to this group. Um, emerging infectious diseases are a, a pressing concern. Actually, this very point is illustrated fantastically by a 2008 paper by Professor Kate Jones in the back. Um, and, and despite strides in, in public health, like hygiene and medical technology, um, they're an increasing threat to global health security in terms of frequency and severity of outbreaks. Um, so, so this challenge is, is prescient. And I, I think really something that we uh, learned from COVID-19 is that um, responding to pandemics is not a sufficient way uh, to address this challenge. Re responding to outbreaks after they occur is not sufficient in terms of morbidity, mortality, and the economic losses. Uh, in, a, in a recent, in a 2021 uh, paper, um, it was measured, uh, an, econo an economic study was performed, um, and the findings were that global strategies to prevent pandemics were estimated at about 22 to 31 billion dollars annually, which is two orders of magnitude less than damages that, pand uh, that are produced by pandemics. So we can really understand why response is not an adequate strategy. Um, so I really want to be thinking about ways in which we can address pandemics before they occur. And I think um, this is important um, and illustrated well by this figure on the right, um, where um, we can see that emerging viral threats are best combated as close to the point of spillover as possible. What we can see in the figure is that there's these natural reservoir hosts that are, are in, in wildlife and points of spillover which occur either uh, between wildlife and livestock species or wildlife directly to human, uh, human species. <laughs> and um, it's, it's that point of, after that point of spillover we, where we see amplification and spread. So averting spillover transmission is critical for that prevention element. 
Now, the spillover process inherently involves human, animal, and environmental interactions, and this is why I think it's so fitting to, to speak in the theme of this session. Um, genetic evolution or virological or microbiological criteria are, are insufficient to understand risk and zoonotic potential. So we can see that from our virological investigations into um, pathogen discovery, that a pathogen might be uh, a sufficient to infect a human, but exposure is needed for spillover to occur. So they may have that structural mechanism, but we need exposure to complete that spillover pathway. Um, and, and human factors tend to be the most salient factors in driving that exposure. So in order to reduce the risk of disease spillover, it's important to understand how these interactions between humans and animals can influence spread. And all that is just illustrated in this little snapshot of daily life that I took at one of our study sites in India, where you can see really how much the environment, wildlife, livestock species, and humans are interacting in almost on a subtle level. We see in this picture dogs. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but we're seeing a dog. We're seeing goats. There's agricultural land. There's fragmented forest. All of these uh, create interfaces between humans and animals that affect disease spread. Um, something prescient about this topic is that risk of zoonotic disease emergence is not uniform across countries um, or across areas. So there are many different ways of thinking about how risk is distributed and these models relate to uh, how we can understand what is important in terms of disease risk. Um, this hotspot map was produced, um, excuse me, in 2017 from a group at EcoHealth Alliance um, uh, led by uh, Tof Allen called Global Hotspots uh, and, and Correlates of Emerging Zoonotic Diseases. And um, the uh, primary drivers used in this model are that of um, uh, EID risk is elevated in forested tropical regions experiencing land use changes and where mammal species richness is high. So those three factors uh, are representative of an environmental factor, a factor related to animals, and a factor related to human behavior. So it's this true One Health topic. Um, through the literature, through my sort of wading through the literature and, and forming um, uh, um, these questions and this, this uh, this space that I'm interested in, um, I've, I, their key uh, drivers have been uh, identified. Um, and I think really they're diverse drivers, but what they all have in common is that they're really at the nexus of environmental and human factors. So major drivers of emerging infectious disease are these land use change and deforestation, livestock production, and wildlife trade. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the details of these, but um, they really do have commonalities in which humans and animals are, are in uh, contact in new ways. Um, there's also uh, secondary drivers, which are, uh, I, I, I believe, also um, play a large role in the amplification and spread. Um, and, and people all day have been uh, talking about their works and projects that relate to these topics. So population and growth um, and urbanization, agricultural intensification, human travel and movement, which we all know was a huge driver of the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, climate change, which affects, which is a, a modifier of all of these. Um, I'm going to end with a couple different models that I think are important to, in understanding this special um, opportunity to think about pandemic prevention as it relates to spillover. Um, risk is not a, a, a flat or singular idea. It's made up of hazard times exposure times vulnerability. Um, and we can, as I said before, really understand, perhaps understand the hazard. Um, but I'm interested in sort of characterizing that those exposure factors Factors. What brings humans into contact with animals and, and what makes it risky? Um, and then vulnerability, I think, is a really important um, element, which wasn't always part of this sort of environmental health uh, equation. 
um, but has I think uh, more and more practitioners have become aware of the importance of vulnerability as a part of the risk equation. Um, the second model that is really a motivator for me and helps me understand risk in this way is the Swiss cheese model, which the origin story is, I think, that of aviation, um, to understand the complex pathway that needs to occur for an adverse uh, uh, event. Um, in this case, the adver adverse event is spillover, and I know I'm running out of time, so what I will say is that something really exciting about the Swiss cheese model is that it presents the idea that as a group of interdisciplinary practitioners, if we're all working on this complex pathway um, at different levels, all we need is one solid slice <laughs> for spillover not to occur. Okay, I'm getting the, the dreaded time end sign. So um, I will present you with this last slide, which is why are we thinking about behavior? Um, and I think behavior is a real element of human exposure. I have a couple really good examples. So um, if folks are interested in this topic and want to come talk to me uh, during the coffee break or uh, afterwards, please do. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alba. And I'm sorry to sort of rush you, but that's what I, I have been asked to do. Uh, so, any questions from the floor, please? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for reading the presentation. Um, you talk about behavior a lot, but the word isn't even institutions. Can you please take so, the microphone? Yeah. The microphone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, yeah, you talked about behavior there and the, the, its important role. What about institutions? So, for example, if you think about an institution, so political scientists, for example, talk about extractive institutions, right? This is things like colonialism, which we've know have played huge roles in this, for example, in, in sort of HIV in Africa. So, where, where do institutions fit into what you're talking about? Or do you subsume them within behavior? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Well, I think in terms of drivers, institutions are huge. I think that institutions uh, could be a protective factor or a risk factor for many of these drivers. Um, but because it's so related, I think, to culture, um, it's really challenging. I will talk a little bit about wildlife trade. So uh, the wildlife trade is a booming industry. Um, the United States is, is um, I think, the second largest importer and exporter, or perhaps second largest importer of, of wildlife trade products. Um, but uh, making policy around wildlife trade is really hard because it's related to livelihood, it's related to culture, um, so it's, it's really complex. I think, um, as we all know, uh, climate change, also there are uh, institutional, uh, we need larger actors other than simply individuals to address all these upstream drivers. Um, I'll also say that institutions, in terms of thinking about One Health, um, institutions play a big role in, in collaborating with each other. So um, to shift the paradigm from uh, human health ministries addressing these health issues to really think broader and make sure that we're uh, incorporating environmental health um, and uh, animal livestock and wildlife health into that conversation is really important. Do we have more questions? <coughs> Okay, so I guess that's time to move on to the next speaker. And our thank you very much. So again, apologies for my uh, pronunciation. So next speaker is Luri Valerio Graciano Borges from University of Sao Paulo, Institute of Astronomy, Geophysics and Atmospheric Sciences from Brazil. So uh, thank you, Patty, for thank you everyone for the attention. Um, I'm, I'm a master's student at the University of São Paulo, so this is my master thesis that I've made. And for a start, in the, in the introduction. So first, about the meteorology and society is uh, a subject that is always related to the society. Since the beginning of the human civilizations, we always were searched for the patterns of nature and atmosphere. And 
the search of these patterns still occurs today and currently provide various sectors of society, such as water supply, uh, aviation, agriculture, transport, and etc. And water supply is one of the most important uh, variables that this subject, meteorology, provides to us. And precipitation is one of the greatest, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, variables of interest in society because it affects not only our daily routine but also of, an example is the proliferation of diseases and in the context of climate change when we have the pattern of increasing of temperature in the global the area of such a uh, arboviruses and vectors of transmission that mostly was restricted to the tropical area of the globe in the climate change context they expand their area of presence to other areas that wouldn't there before so talking about the Aedes Egypt is one of the most principles um, vectors of transmission of arboviruses and his life cycle is mostly correlated with the water, so mostly in the eggs and larval stages of his life. And the best climate conditions to this vector of transmission is, of course, a humid tropical climate, temperatures between 12 and 36 degrees Celsius, high levels of relative humidity, and of course, the occurrence of precipitation that brings water to the, the breeding sites. And dengue, talking about dengue, of course, is one of the most important and let me just keep, one of the most important arboviruses in the world. So one of these characteristics it has the serotypes, that is different responses immune that the body shows to the virus. And also altogether there are four types, then one, two, three, and four, and of course they can cause the epidemics that are registered. So the mitigation measures for this vector of transmission is of hardly control because of its great adaptivity ability. And the geographical area of the cities and the geographical space will determine if these mitigations are efficient or not. So the main goal of my research was seek a better understanding of the influence of precipitation on the increase and decline of cases of arboviruses dengue in the city of Recife, Pernambuco, evaluated together with the influence of the serotypes on the population. Talking about the methodology now, the study area, as I said, is in Recife, so in the tropical area of Brazil, in the north. <clears throat> The data used in this re research corresponding to health data, weather data, and sanitation data to provide us information about confirmed cases of dengue, uh, serotypes, uh, mostly in me monthly frequency, and weather data also. <coughs> An analysis with a regression model was used, and the regression model explains how a variable is affected by other independent variables. So a generalized expression for a regression model is this first equation here. <coughs> and for this work, we used the negative binomial regression type to try to predict the cases of dengue. <coughs> and why we we'll use this type of regression analysis? Because, of course, of the characteristic of the variable that we are analyzing. So it's cases of dengue in this case. So the cases of dengue has a variance that is much more higher than the average of the time series. <clears throat> Not only in the daily frequency, but also in the monthly frequency. So the models used for this work was, as I said, a simulation using regression analysis to cases of dengue using First simulation was only with weather data that determines the cases of dengue, and the second simulation is with this weather of data, but the implementation of the serotypes then the information on this simulation. And another simulation was used to climate simulation to provide us if we can predict and represent the precipitation 
on the receive fee area. So about the results now, this is the monthly uh, average for precipitation and cases of dengue, being cases of dengue the orange line and the bars on blue the precipitation, we see on this left graph that is all the time series on average monthly and they all uh, they correspond effectively well but if we remove the years of epidemics we have this second graph which we have a much more correlated pattern with the rainy season being the mostly high cases and the dry season the low cases. Then the seasonal pattern we see uh, also correlated. So the first will be the with the epidemic years, the second without the epidemic years, and the last with the pattern of seasonal on precipitation. And also winter and autumn being this the rainy season and which also we have the high cases on these both seasons. Talking about the classification of precipitation on receive, the precipitation profile, we made a, a classification on the daily precipitation on receive. So we have a classes of dry day, much uh, very weak, weak, moderate, strong, and very strong precipitation. And correlating with the rainy season, which is autumn and winter, we see that precipitations such as weak, modern, and strong are very correlated with the high cases of dengue. Analyzing the profile precipitation on monthly precipitation, we see that the epidemics such as 220 and 2 are uh, a day where we have a very rainy season of precipitation. <coughs> Analyzing sanitation data, for the sake of time, I'll be just summarizing. Uh, for the receiving specific, we have a good sanitation data, but the around, the municipalities around, doesn't have the same on talking about the disposal of garbage on residents. <coughs> so the geographical data also show us that in the tax of 10 cases per person, we have that the Recife area is one of the greatest in all the region. Analyzing the regression analysis now, we have that this first simulation gives us this pattern, and if we increase, if we add the serotypes information, the model can see the epidemics events. And analyzing the correlation between the observer data, there was an increase in correlation in the second round. Analyzing now the climate simulations, we see three uh, simulations where the Hege era is one of the most that mostly approximates with precipitation on monthly and seasonably patterns. <coughs> Okay, so the conclusions of this work is that does precipitation explains the increase in dengue cases? And the response is yes, mostly in the monthly and seasonal patterns of precipitation. And how the serotypes affect dengue of cases is that the serotypes affect mostly on the epidemics events of the time series. The sanitation in Recife reflects the proliferation of the vector, and the answer is for Recife, we found a good quality of sanitation, but the around areas wasn't so good, so that might affect the, ca the increased cases in the municipality of Dengue itself, the, in Recife itself. And is public policy effective in the mitigation of vector? Of course it is, but by doing this research, we couldn't find a data that could specifically say which period mostly affect the cases of dengue. But it's a point that we have to do in mind. And for less, did the reg CM4, the climate uh, model for precipitation simulations, represent the precipitation? And the answer is uh, yes, mostly for monthly and seasonal patterns, which are the two uh, scales of time that mostly correlated precipitation to cases of dengue. That's all for now. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. So,
Thank you very much, uh, Louis. Just, uh, I think we just need to be careful about what we are wishing for. Yeah. A little bit. Mm -hmm. So, can I check for any questions from the floor? Uh, any comments, any insights into what has been discussed? So, so what, what is the next step? The next step? Yes. Would be, mostly, would be due on another region of Brazil, because Recife is a tropical region. So, mm -hmm. the equa is next near to equator, and it's a coastal line. So the temperature and the humidity doesn't vary along the year. Mm -hmm. So analyze this in a, another region of Brazil where we have a greater variability of temperature and relative humidity will help us to express not only precipitation but what other weather variables would help us to understand this correlation between the cases of mm -hmm. these arbovirus such as them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. So Please go. But uh, yeah, oh, sorry. take the microphone, please. Yeah. Hello, Yuri. Uh, I've got a question for you, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so like in your model, when you try to predict cases, do you fit temperature and relative humidity together, or are they kept separately? Yes. Uh, on the first simulation that was only with weather data, we used. Are you guys seeing me? Oh, hearing me well. We use precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, and days of precipitation on the month. So basically, this was the weather variables that was used on the model, okay. not only precipitation. Yeah. Okay, because like um, with humidity, I remember like I tried fitting relative humidity with temperature, both both of them together, and I honestly got a right bollocking not to use them two together. Because they yes. say, I think, relative humidity is like, like a function of temperature and water. So some, something like issue of like, you know, multicollinearity, stuff like this. Like, yeah. Which it's, on, yeah. Because okay. uh, the, the precipitation in, in relative humidity, they do correlate, but we are analyzing here the monthly average of relativity, relativity humidity. So the, the numbers on the monthly average is around... 19, uh, 1980 on Recife, of course. And in that case, it doesn't correlate a lot with precipitation, mostly because precipitation occurs when we have a relative humidity near to 100, right? So on an average monthly, we don't see much of that pattern when we do, we analyze in this scale of time. Uh -huh. so, so that's why. Oh, okay. Oh, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, excellent. Do we have more um, questions or can we stand? Thank you very much. Another <laughs> round of applause. So our third presentation is going to be a joint presentation by Luisa Campos and Clarissa Lins de Lima from Department of Civil Engineering, uh, Civil Environmental and Geometric Engineering at UCL and Polytechnic School of the University of Pernambuco in Brazil. The floor is yours. So, okay, no, we are not going to be so close. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, we are going to present here the, the, the water and sanitation conditions. Uh, in the project areas, area, at least one case study. The, uh, wh why we are doing this is we are interested to identify the hotspots, right, uh, of the, where the mosquitoes are breeding, you know, because we all know that the environmental conditions, although we know that uh, in Brazil it's uh, Rich areas and poor areas, they all have the, the, the problem of uh, dengue and Zika. But obviously, the poor is all vulnerable, right? They, they obviously sanitation, water and sanitation conditions and the way the waste is managed, it helps, uh, it helps to improve uh, the control, right? The control of the, this, the, the outbreaks, obviously. So, the idea of, of uh, having this part in, in the MIWAR project is exactly to identify the hotspots for mosquito uh, breeding and also what are the practices associated that we could then feedback the, the team that is developing the app, right? 
uh, Aisha and, 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 and the others there, uh, and, 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 and Tiago as well, that we could, uh, how can we improve that, right? So uh, I, I will pass, uh, I, I will, before I pass that, I forgot to say, right? The, this, uh, the questionnaire was designed by, by, by the UCL team in, in collaboration with the whole team, obviously. We have obtained uh, uh, ethics approval in, 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 at UCL and also in Brazil. So we, we have already applied the questionnaire in, in Recife case study, and now we are starting applying in Campina Grande a, a, a case study. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, uh, it we all you know uh, 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 delayed our, our our questionnaire, and we don't have uh, we don't have many results to, to to talk to you today here. But we we are in, in making a good progress, so we are going to. Uh, Clarice is going to present to yourself here the, 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 the findings. So hi everyone. Uh, as Luisa said, these are just our pre preliminary results. So uh, our study area is Nova Descoberta, which is a neighborhood in Recife. We can, you can see the, this area which is highlighted in the map of Recife. And Nova Descoberta has approximately uh, 34,000 uh, inhabitants, and the average monthly income is around uh, 859 and 39 uh, he in reais, which is the Brazilian currency. So according to the IBGE, which is our governmental uh, uh, institute to, to, for, for census data, uh, Nova Descoberta can be considered a poorer area because considering the minimal age per month, it's below, uh, it's below two, two minimal wage per family. So, um, so uh, this questionnaire, they were applied to 23 participants and they were selected according to the, the agent's uh, schedule. So every time the agent would visit a house in, a, in, the, in Nova Descoberta, uh, we applied this, this, this questionnaire. And it is divided in six sections. The first one is regarding water supply of, that, of the, the, the household. The second one is regarding sanitation and stormwater drainage system. The fourth one is related to solid waste and disposal. These others is related, it's, uh, there are many uh, things related, for example, how they, what are the measures that they, what they take to, to, to their act, the, the population actions to, to uh, avoid the breeding sites of the mosquito. And the, the, the last one was a bit more about the person who were, uh, who were, being, uh, who were being questioned, uh, like their, their gender and their salary and those things. So <laughs> from the results, so far, uh, regarding the water supply, uh, most, of the pop most of the responses, they said that they do have a water tank in their household. These are one of the water, these are an example of water tank. I mean, it's very common in very areas in, in, in Recife because many of these, uh, many of the population do not have a regular water supply. So, for example, they can spend up to 15 days without running water in their pipe and they have to store the water until the, 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 the system is regulated. So they do, they do have this uh, blue disposal, like the blue uh, tank right there. Sometimes they are disposed on the floor, sometimes it's up at the, to uh, at the top of their houses, and these are the way that is mostly common to uh, store water. However, we can see that not everyone uh, properly covers those waters, so what they they store them and they leave like inappropriate lids, which in this case is not actually the most appropriate one. So in these cases, the mosquitoes they can uh, deposit their eggs there, which is can which can uh, in the future hatch and turn into larvae and you know increases the mosquito density in that area. 
when it comes to the observation of stagnant uh, of mosquitoes in stagnant ponds, most of the responses were positive to that. Uh, they also uh, very frequently they observe mosquitoes in the open drained channel of the of their burrow. So it's a it's something that is very frequent to see. And mostly of the storm water, they are drained straight to the straight to the streets. And actually, in, in so many cases, uh, there are many flooding in his, in Recife. So there are many points of well, of the uh, where the the rainwater after it 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 can it's it is accumulated in certain spots of the houses. Uh, and when it comes to these other questions of what the measures that they take to prevent the outbreak of arboviruses, uh, the most common one is like they cover tightly the water containers. Uh, it's quite a, 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 a contrast with what we saw in the first slides because they say they cover, but we can see that it's not up to 90% of the people who does cover the, 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 their water tank. The other uh, frequent measure that they take is to use mosquito repellent to actually provide to get infected with the arboviruses. And, uh, and they usually add larvicide to their tank water. I mean, when they're in, during outbreaks occasions, the agents, they guide the, the population to add larvicide at their own water tank. So the conclusions we can have is this pilot, this pilot study, they can help us to comprehend a little bit of the reality in the in Nova Descoberta neighborhood. I mean, although the, 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 although the number of people participated in the questionnaire was, was not high, not, was not a lot, but we can have a, a, a how can I say? We can have an idea of how the reality is. <laughs> it can guide us also to identify the practices of the, of the community and how these practices are favorable for the mosquito to reproduce, to repro the, uh, the mosquito breeding sites and to mosquito to reproduce. And it can point out also the deficiencies in sanitation and water distribution that can be associated with mosquitoes uh, pro proliferation. And we can also speculate uh, that wa uh, water and sanitation practices in Nova Descoberta are exacerbating to the mosquitoes pro proliferation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So that's one minute earlier than. Uh, Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, um, questions, questions, please. Let's start from this Lots side. Lots of questions here. Yeah. Wow, wow, you like. It's almost <laughs> end of the day. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, out of this kind of like uh, four uh, parts of the infrastructure, water supply, uh, uh, sanitary system or sanitation, and also the uh, urban drainage system, and also wastewater, uh, waste management system, which one do you think has got like a more impact? Yeah, on, we, on, on the disease, actually, yeah, yeah, in your we, case study. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, we haven't done an analysis yet. Our plan is to, to do a statistical analysis, and if we can also look into the, the outbreak numbers, right, the cases, it would be, it would be better for us to, to, to understand. But, but we, don't, we haven't done any analysis yet, and also we, we, we plan to run a, a, a workshop with the stakeholders right now in November uh, that has been delayed so that we can learn more about that, but we don't have that answer, which, which aspect is influencing more, the most on the outbreaks. Any guess or any kind of like idea from what we observe? Well, from what we observe, I would say, I, I would say that uh, the, the waste management is, is one of the key factors, you know, if, if in Brazil, I, I think Clarice can, can respond that better than me. I'm Brazilian, right? And I used to live there. But uh, having, you know, if you have a plot that is not a well looked after and, and, and they, they, they throw rubbish there, and that is a, is a way for mosquitoes to be, you know, to, to be developed. So I think that is, it's, uh, it's key.
uh, management. And, and, and obviously, I would say that water as well, stagnant water, uh, it's, it's, we used to have lots of fountain and stuff like that, but now I, I think most of the place has removed to avoid. Otherwise, we have to treat with chlorine. Thank you, sir. Um, thanks. Thanks for the great presentation. It's a great project. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw that a lot of the questions on your questionnaire were related to practices around mosquito control and how people cover, um, cover their items or things like this or how they remove them. Did you have any investigation into the knowledge that these community members held around mosquitoes' ability to transmit these diseases? Uh, some of the, the work that I've done on, on NEPA or something like this, uh, community members aren't aware that the bats are transmitting these diseases. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of whether that there's a uniformity among the knowledge about disease transmission from mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that question. That question would have been answered in our focus group that we haven't, we haven't uh, run with the community. We had planned to run focus group with, with the community to identify if they have that knowledge and how they perceive the risk of, you know, if you leave the, 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 the if you throw away a, a, a tire, for example, it's a common practice, uh, accumulating tire or, or any, any empty bottles. So if the community have that perception that they are in, in, in increasing, you know, that exposure, right, to, to, to the risk. But unfortunately, we don't have, we haven't done that. Thank you. Hope, hope, hope to, to, to do in future. Thank you very much um, for an excellent presentation. <clears throat> so my original background was in, in WASH, so I've done quite a lot of work on measuring um, behaviour. I wondered, have you um, tried any different approaches to actually um, obtaining the data? So for example, um, using standardised tools or other types of things like structured observation to observe people's actual um, behaviour and compare it compare that with how they actually report their behavior? Uh, that's a good, get, that's a good point. Uh, however, the way, because of uh, the way uh, the, the project has been run under COVID, uh, it has been very difficult. Would be ideal for us, for example, to run uh, a, 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 a transit walk, right? For us to observe the, the local practice there by the community, but unfortunately did not happen. The, the easiest, way, easiest way for us how to e enter in contact with the household was through the agent, the health agents, who, who, who have a, a routine from household to ho household. Thiago can say that better for, than, than me. Uh, for us to apply the questionnaire, but uh, it would be ideal for us to do the observations that you are pointing out. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Thanks so much. We can have a, a chat about it. Thank you. I think we have this yes, here. I've got a question for you folks. For me? <laughs> yeah, both of you actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, Clarice, I'm a <laughs> Clarice too. Yeah, because um, the images that you showed, it has also a very stark parallel to, like, you know, places, well, places that I have a strong affinity for in sub Saharan Africa, like Ghana and Nigeria. It's an unfortunate reality there where we also have, you know, like barrels, which sometimes we don't kind of cover, which is a source for, like, you know, infestation for, you know, the Anopheles mosquito where we have malaria, etc. But also, like, in terms of waste management as well, like, the way we dispose of wastewater, especially like in urban places here, yeah, like, on the sides of the streets, they are uncovered which we call gutters. And that's where most of our offensive material go and is actually exposed, which also serves as a source of you know, infestation too. I was wondering if this awful reality is also present in urban parts of Brazil, like having gutters on the side of streets and 
where wastewater is also disposed there. That's my question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a reality in some parts of Brazil too. Like open. How can I say? Hmm? Open drainage. Yes. 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 It, it is a reality in Brazil too. Um, so is is there any kind of action that is being taken to try and seal them? Like any quick kind of action, or <laughs> is it just something persistent? Well, the, 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 the action is the, the this provision of water and sanitation. Brazil serves in terms of water supply is, is quite good, although uh, the region north, in, in, up in the Amazon there, it's, uh, it's the most that is, is, is not 100% supplied by, by clean water. Uh, but most of the capitals in Brazil, they all have uh, drainage, uh, sewage drainage and, 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 and clean water. But on the informal settlement is a problem, is a problem, I would say. So we would see that uh, running, running uh, waste uh, on, the, on the roads or on the streets. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So with that, thank we, you. Should, we should really close the session. So thank you again. So, thank you. So um, just to remind, there is tea and coffee downstairs. And uh, the next session, that's a strategic panel that starts at sh sharp at 6 p.m. So please, uh, is it 6? OK, that, that's uh, what she's OK, probably. Okay, so please be back here at 6 p.m. Uh, Vice Provost is going to be uh, opening this, uh, the, the session, so try to make sure that you are back here at 6 p.m. Thank you again for everyone in the session.
Ah, got to wait for the video to start. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. <laughs> we'll start again. I'm Garrett Rees. I'm the Vice Provost for Research, Innovation and Global Engagement. It is my pleasure to welcome this amazing panel we have for you tonight uh, to talk about uh, digital one health and global warming. Now, I've been asked just to say uh, a few remarks, so I'll say a few remarks. Um, the first is really to congratulate Patty and her colleagues on the third anniversary of this centre, uh, which is, I think, amazing and exemplifies many of the best things that we want out of digital public health in an emergency. It has not escaped your attention that we have just had a public health emergency for approximately the last two years, and it was to do with things that many people on this panel have been writing about for at least the last 15 years, uh, a global zoonotic pandemic. So in my kind of opening remarks, I, I, I'd just make a couple of observations. So one is, as we talk about the next global pandemic, Lots and lots of people seem to be focusing on technological solutions, uh, virus sentinel networks that will sequence emerging pathogens all around the world and transmit the sequence automatically to some central repository where we will stop the next pandemic. Um, and in that context, I, I, I'd observed that the sequence of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was in the public domain in, I think, January 2020. And it made not a blind bit of difference, really, to what happened next. So that isn't to say that digital technological interventions aren't desperately important and could be really potentially useful. But it tells you that public health in an emergency is about much more than that. I think it tells you, first of all, um, as I'm sure some on this panel will say, that you need to know what happened before the virus. The bat, the biodiversity loss population changes, and in fact, interesting things about bats, like why are they hard ve uh, vectors of zoonotic disease in the first place? So that's about perhaps an under-neglected area, which is actually research into animal and wildlife health, which some on our panel represent. And then I think on the other end, you need to know, well, why, if everyone knew it was coming, um, did actually it evolve the way it did? And that's, of course, because us humans were in the loop, um, and human behaviour, and how societies respond, and how public health is constructed at that social level, and the individual web of incentives and motivations for people to do things, is also, I think, important. And so it's bringing all of those things together that is not only important for our panel tonight, but I think is an important function of things like uh, the Centre for Public Health, Digital Public Health. And then the final thing I'd say, the second thing I'd say, is that is also a natural role for universities more generally. Most of the problems that are facing our societies, I would argue now, are complex, multifactorial, difficult, and in fact some people would use the word wicked, in a technical sense, wicked problems. Whether they're things like climate crisis, global inequality, pandemics, you name it. And that's one of the things, of course, that universities are particularly good at bringing together, and I hope we at UCL are particularly good at bringing together, people from different disciplines to work together in a truly cross-disciplinary way to tackle those global challenges in a creative, flexible way. Now, that's not to say the universities are going to solve it on our own. We are part of an ecosystem ourselves, if you like. We are part of a network of companies, governments, agencies, and so on. But I think universities are, particularly comprehensive universities like ours, are the catalytic agents in that ecosystem that can help develop the response both to global warming and to all the health problems that accrue from it. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to go to the back of the room um, and exit at some point. Um, but I welcome the panel. Patty, am I going to introduce everyone by name? Or, or shall, shall, are you going to do that? How are we going to do that? Andrew will do that. Yeah. Andrew over there, Hayward, spelt with an A, not an E, um, but that's a common error, he tells me. Um, we'll introduce the panel. Andrew, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, Patty, for inviting me to this. It's, it's actually interesting. When I was uh, being asked to do it, I was preparing some teaching for uh, our new Masters in Public Health, and I was looking at the history of public health uh, and, and the sort of big eras of public health right through from sort of miasma, sanitation, germ theory, health promotion. And actually it struck me that maybe this One Health
concept is the next wave uh, of public health. This recognition, uh, if you like, of the true interconnectedness uh, of uh, our survival and, and, and the planet and, and our, our need for custodianship of the planet and our ability to look after each other is a to, to my mind, that's a new way of thinking about public health. And also within the history of public health, of course, you, we were teaching people that all the epidemics and the, you know, the age of pestilence has died, and that's clearly not true. We're still uh, subject to regular pandemics, you know, uh, influenza, uh, 1918, uh, HIV, uh, antimicrobial resistance, COVID more recently, it could come on, and they've, all of those have a, a zoonotic component, uh, and uh, all of them are deeply connected with this idea as well. So I think uh, studying this, as we say, needs a real interdisciplinary approach, and that's why it's so exciting to have this panel here today to talk about this concept. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, Introduce you one by one. My memory may get a few, few things wrong, but Patty, I think, probably needs no introduction. She's been organising uh, these uh, highly interdisciplinary events for, for many, many years and is leading the Centre for Digital Public Health, uh, has won many awards and, and really focused on uh, sort of digital public health in emergencies, particularly in infectious disease areas, working for WHO and, and other groups. Uh, and then our next panellist, um, Professor Andrew Cunningham, uh, is a real top expert in zoology. Uh, so at the Institute of Zoology, um, working particularly on uh, zoonoses. Uh, and uh, one thing that terrified me about what you do is your work with um, bats in um, in, in Africa, uh, and then there's sort of not a lot of convention, so that seems quite brave to me, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure it's very fascinating as well. Uh, and then we have uh, Julio uh, Davila, uh, so uh, real expertise from around the world in uh, civil engineering, urban planning, and, and particularly advising uh, on this massive global phenomenon of urbanization which is changing the landscape and, and, and is a central part of this One Health concept. Um, and uh, Kate, Professor Kate Jones, uh, ecologist, uh, and so you're at the Centre for Biodiversity and Environmental Research and, and I think really it's, it's quite central to your work to be thinking about this interconnection between the environment, between global health and, uh, and, and between global warming. So uh, I'm going to be fascinated to hear what you have to say. And then Tiaccio um, uh, Massoni, uh, I, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, but from Federal University of Campina Grande yep. yeah, in Brazil, uh, is a uh, computer scientist, software engineer, uh, particularly interested in the uh, uh, some of the aspects of software engineering about how teams work and things. And I think uh, when we're thinking about digital solutions within this ecosystem, it, uh, these sorts of considerations are really important. So, so you've got a great panel. They're all going to give you uh, 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 their thoughts on this area. But before we start, Patty's going to uh, just give a little bit more context as to the uh, question we're discussing. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you for us staying until the last session for this great debate. So, the whole topic, as you who have been here for all day, actually have followed, is bringing together the concept, bringing to light the concept of One Health. It's not a new concept. Since my days at WHO, One Health was on the table, but it just hasn't been implemented, hasn't been driven, and we still are stuck with the way of thinking of the animal health and surveillance, for human is just different than the surveillance and the way we treat uh, the animals. These two worlds have not been merged. And I think it's great what Andrew has said, we have to think again how we make One Health topical. The global warming, obviously, is an, it's a crisis. The house is on a fire, quoting a famous teenager. We really have to do something about it, not just for the sake of Earth and humankind on Earth, but also the implications for um, 
virus spillovers for tropical diseases, obviously spreading to mid middle climates as we have seen today, presented by uh, Brazil. This is something which is becoming acute and acute in our generation. The question about inequality and poverty, again, has been, has been accelerated by um, the massive urbanizations, especially in um, low American income countries. And it was exciting to see how many of our speakers from the MIWA project have pointed out how important it is to look into sanitation and water management in the context of preventing um, disease spread and disease acceleration. But it all links to poverty, it all links to inequality lack of investment in areas of uh, urban neglect, favelas and, and townships. So if there's going to be a next pandemic, it's going to be a zoonotic pandemic or it's going to be back to war and we really have to be better prepared. So this panel will look into from different perspectives in how we can really get our act together a little bit sooner than when the pandemic hits and how we can increase the chances of responding to the next pandemics through better one health systems and perhaps by the technology can help a little bit but not too much <laughs> thank you very much uh, so i think we're going to take it in turn uh, and uh, you've had your instructions uh, four or five minutes um, no slides julio's ignored the no slides <laughs> 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 That's all right, we'll forgive you. <laughs> uh, so perhaps if I could start with Andrew. Uh, sure, so um, I think for, I think the best way is to sort of talk through how I came into working in the One Health area. So I started working as a, a wildlife veterinary pathologist uh, back in the late 1980s. And over the next few years, um, I was mainly working on um, disease threats to wildlife conservation. And there are two main types of disease threats to wildlife conservation. There are the threats to highly threatened, critically endangered species that maybe there's only a few hundred or a few thousand left. And then it's a stochastic effect of diseases that probably have always affected those species. Um, but because they're so rare now, the, disease, the added burden of the disease on morbidity and mortality is a threat to their conservation. But there's the other group of uh, disease threats to species conservation, and that is where new diseases emerge and cause uh, uh, catastrophic morbidity, mortality, uh, including uh, causing major losses in what would previously have been common species. And seeing the impacts and, and the drivers of these diseases in free living wildlife that you wouldn't think had uh, a big issue with, with uh, human intervention, but the underlying drivers were always anthropocentric. They were always caused uh, anthropogenic. They were always caused by people. And you can see, you could, it became clear to me that the same issues were occurring in wildlife as were occurring in livestock as were occurring in people. And that the threats to wildlife were the same uh, as the potential and as we've seen actual threats to people. So this was sort of putting things into the, a, a One Health context. And, and I start with the wildlife because I think it's really important that when we think of One Health, we're not talking just about zoonotic disease emergence from livestock or from wildlife. We're talking about the health of everything on this planet, of all living things on this planet. So it's about biodiversity, it's about species, species conservation, but also population abundances of animals and plants and about habitat loss. And so we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have this anthropocentric view of One Health. One Health is about everything out there. Thank you. Um, I think you've summarised that beautifully uh, and on time. Uh, so <laughs> uh, the challenge is over to you now, Emilio. Wow, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank
thank you, Patti, and everybody for this um, invitation. I, I feel like a bit of an outsider, being an engineer and planner. But a, a little bit of a story um, is I came into the urban health um, horizon about 10, 15 years, 12 years ago, when the Lancet um, commissioned UCL to write a long report on urban health. And I was, I jumped at the occasion and I have learned huge amounts since then from working with, with colleagues um, in UCL and elsewhere. And I, I realize how important it is for us planners to understand the issue of health because the world is urban, it is becoming more urban, and, and it's, it's getting concentrated. Even if it's suburbanizing in some cases, there are always health implications to all this. So I've, I've been thinking, and my work has been largely in the global south, probably more in Latin America than anywhere else, but a, a little bit of Africa and uh, Asia. So if I can, oh, there you are, okay, good. Uh, so this, this is just a, a, a the summary. I, I think one project that did a lot of um, learning for me, or, was this project that uh, this not quite summarizes, but it's from one of the several outputs that have come out of it. And it's uh, an article where I'm not an author, but I admire enormously the work that my colleagues did. This is by James Hassel, um, who was a postdoc at the time. And this is a five-year project looking at E. coli in Nairobi. So what is fascinating about this is that you can see several gradients. And I'm just going to stand up and probably point at it. Uh, with so what for me as a planner is thinking okay what do we have built environment uh, professionals to contribute to this uh, as opposed to sort of public health or epidemiologists or, or, or vets as in the case of Andrew and, and, and this project involved all of them uh, and, and geneticists too um, um, sorry and, and what you have is this is like a, a, a representation, abstract representation of ACT, but effectively it is Nairobi, where, where you have on the left not only low density areas, but also rich areas, which is, if anybody knows Nairobi, that's a, that's a, that's a, a marker of the, the highland. And then, and then, the fir and then of course, there's, uh, there's all sorts of um, ecosystems which have been trained, changed. And the further you go inside the city, you will find something which is unusual in, and would be unusual in Latin America, is, is sort of fairly large inner city slums, very, very large with enormous densities, which, which are different in Latin and, and they have a different tenure system. So uh, what you have is not only an issue of density, but an issue of, and that's where the, uh, am I not being heard? Thank you, good. Uh, and, and, but also you have, the, the wealth that is showing here, there's a difference in, in elevation. And there's here the degree of habitat alteration that you find. Here it's relatively untouched or, or touched by um, human beings, but you know, generations ago. And on the right hand side, you've got uh, a whole degree of interventions where you've got essentially a low biotic habitat diversity. But the other dimension, and it relates to what Andrew just said, is you've got high levels of wildlife on this, presumably on this side, but here you've got an enormous degree of um, of um, synanthrope species. So in, these are species that like what we do and what we eat, uh, like mice and others. I mean, uh, Andrew is the, is the expert in this, and he'll correct me. But so, just to summarise, because I've probably gone over time now, Andrew, uh, is, is, okay, what is the role of, of several um, professions here? And it is important because I, my research, like everybody is, has to have a policy dimension at the end. Otherwise, I feel I'm being, being completely useless. And so I think in our research from an urban planning point of view, which includes not only the physical environment, but also the social environment, is understanding these phenomena in terms of you know, the slums, uh, density behind that, who lives in there, nature of poverty, and, and how planning and land use planning actually affects and, any, and, and creates these this, the, the, this phenomena. And so that's where our role comes in, is, is to actually sort of feed into that complex process, which is of course led by people like Andrew and Kate and, 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 um, uh, and so on, not, not by us, but we're there to sort of help understand the complexity of the process. So that's where I 
justify my existence in this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's no need to justify it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so let's move on to you, Kate. Oh, well, thank you. And thanks, Patty, for the invitation. And, uh, and well done on three years. That's really brilliant. Um, so I guess as an ecologist, I'm really interested in um, picking the links between ecosystem health and uh, the health of the ecosystem and human health. And I've had a particular focus on infectious diseases for a number of years. And I've led some of the work seminal work on understanding these kinds of drivers. Uh, but I've also um, worked on bat ecology and evolution of the past 30 years. And so my, my somewhat niche interests have come together uh, in the last couple of years with the, with the pandemic. So I guess um, I've got kind of three thoughts that I'd like to, to kind of kick off with really about this area, One Health uh, in an era of global warming. One of them is the dangers of siloed thinking, and, and you said that, Andrew, and also Garite. Um, and I think that the pandemic has, has really focused global attention on the role of how ecosystem and degradation of ecosystems has, you know, uh, is promoting the transmission of pathogens from one set of species into another, and this transmission of pathogens across these interfaces and these jumps. However, this ecological link, this fundamental concept of ecology, and you just talked about it, and you showed one of my PhD students' graph there, figure. This concept of ecology is virtually ignored in public health. And, you know, this is a real problem. And, and I think that it really severely limits our, our ability to predict and prevent the next pandemic. If we ignore the fundamental concept of ecology and how, ecos how ecosystems put together and how species interact. So we need a much more integrated approach which links human health, animal health and wildlife and ecosystem health together. So unless we start integrating those fields, we're not going to solve this problem. So my second point is about it not being just about climate. So climate is one aspect of a rapidly changing planet. And uh, we talked uh, earlier today about a HEV model of risk. So hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. So if you think about hazard being the kind of animal dimension, uh, you know, wildlife and vectors, and how um, you know, that poses a hazard of, of, of pathogen jumping in, into humans, then we've also got exposure and behavioral change of exposure to expose human populations or, or other species to those jumps. And then we've got vulnerability, and vulnerability being a kind of um, modifier of whether you then get infected by the exposure. So if you think about those three things, that adds up to risk. But global change in terms of climate change changes the hazard, changes your exposure, and changes your vulnerability. But so does land use change. So does demographic shifts. So when we start to think about this, it's a systems-wide concept that you need to think about anthropogenic change acting on all parts of this. And if we don't do that, then we won't predict it. My final point is about operationalization of these concepts. So we're really struggling to go from these nice ideas I've just talked about <laughs> to actually person in the field integrating these ideas into a plan, you know, a plan that operates with the ecologists, with the public health people, with the vets. How to pull that together is really hard. And I think that's the kind of fundamental interface that we need to start to think about. Thank you. I love your, your structure to that. Um, and Jadjo. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Patty, and the great opportunity to be here. Um, as a computer scientist, I, I believe in the power of technology for uh, at least minimizing uh, the problems we're facing, but to borrow one term of the from the title of the panel, 
Uh, one thing that I learned in these last few years of collaboration with this fantastic interdisciplinary uh, work that we have been uh, involved in Brazil is that technology is not global, I would say. Uh, I tend to compare this with the uh, unequal access to technology we had during this pandemic for example, and the effect this will have in education uh, for the next few years uh, for the people who doesn't have access to technology and how this the, their education was affected. Uh, so differences exist between individuals and social groups in terms of the access to technologies, but also uh, regarding the context we're into. Uh, we can say that digital literacy, for example, is a concept probably very familiar with uh, most of you, is that uh, the degree we, uh, in the individuals have in the capacity, knowledge, or uh, motivation to engage and use technology. Taking this out of the equation and just say, okay, this is a problem, we have to f face this and we have to deal with it. But even though uh, we figure out a way of overcoming this, we still have the context. And the context uh, is so diverse. And that's something that I've been learning. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate with the case we have been working with. Uh, so that's something that I have uh, at least uh, a bit of uh, knowledge to talk about. We're talking about the work we have with the health workers uh, in trying to control uh, arboviruses in Brazil and other countries. And we're going there and offer them an app for a mobile phone app for replacing the paper forms they use every day and make their work so hard. Uh, they are the first layer of public health in these places, usually. Um, these are like probably a, a list of urgent things we have to deal with, but the first question is always, okay, but my smartphone is like 10 years old. How can I install this app? It's not even installing. Okay, let's try it. Uh, maybe the government can buy us the, the mobile phones because we don't have access to those new phones. Okay, let's try it. Uh, maybe we can fix a temporary solution and try to come up with something. But, okay, but when you use your app, you need a data plan. Uh, okay, we're gonna fix you a data plan. Let's try it, maybe. But 30% of the city's area is not covered by any carrier. So we need something to make it offline. Probably uh, we have to deal with this. So, okay, let's think about that. Uh, it's probably there's a way, there's a technology-based solution for that. Uh, okay, but let's assume that we are solving all these problems and all these last minute uh, uh, issues. But then later, uh, one of the agents uh, raised their, his hand and said, Okay, uh, great, but I'm not visiting, visiting properties uh, in a few neighborhoods I have to go because my smartphone the criminals will take it because smartphones are very valuable here especially for drug dealing mm -hmm. drugs are actually exchanged by smartphones in this area so if I go with my smartphone then I will be subject to this so we're still <laughs> trying to deal with this so Okay, right now for pilot testing, for example, we have to go to a, a, a temporary solution with the offline uh, app. 
they go back they go back to the base and then they will have to register the information in the app which was supposed to be in field like using the GPS data for uh, feeding uh, the databases we want to analyze and perhaps the next step would have to be go to the government and ask them to buy uh, some kind of a specific uh, device that has only one function and maybe these devices will not be attractive enough for the criminals so that's the that's what I say the technology the solutions are not global so it's very context specific so we have to think about that because this is beyond software and hard hardware problems so uh, for technology solutions we cannot assume in specific context and this is something that we have to uh, to care about thank you very much it's promise and challenge I think uh, and we're going to finish uh, back on uh, Patty. Thank you very much, Andrew. So with my um, digital public health expertise hat on, not as a conveyor of the panel, when I, 20 years ago, with a fresh degree in computer science, uh, came to WHO thinking how I'm going to save the world by developing database solutions for low-income <coughs> countries, I just realized, oh my goodness, this is cottage industry. The IT systems just do not work. And learning to work with different professions, learning to work with people who actually are experts in different domains, and come from a completely different angle has opened my eyes. And I spent 20 years bridging between computer science and initially public health, making sure public health experts understand that the technology isn't just kind of the IT support you add on to your project budget, but actually it's about just the epidemiology and public health. Actually, both are important to deliver something functional. But at the same time, computer scientists get excited about, about their fastest machine learning algorithm and they just use a case study. And the case study could be from public health, yeah, but they don't actually get involved in fully understanding the challenges which need to be solved. And of course, the, um, the animal world, as we have heard from experts in ecology and um, bovos, livestock and wildlife, this is, I think, the third dimension. We cannot see human health as human health without taking the context of the animal health. So the digital one of health actually is embracing all three parts of this triangle. And it does not stop just with the triangle. I think we've seen it at the Ebola outbreak in, in Africa, how the purely epidemiological approach completely ignored the local practices and how understanding the, the anthropological part of the social behaviors and like barrier behaviors, for example, uh, in, in Western Africa was, was one of the key drivers for, um, for the spread of the disease. So making sure we also embrace um, the behavior experts and anthropologists, truly having the understanding that these big challenges are so interdisciplinary, we just can't solve them ourselves. We have to get our hands dirty in working together in teams. I think we are quite good at this in academia. We all get together, and this is an example. This day has been amazing. We have experts from so many disciplines, and this panel is an example. I think we really have to get out there and not just end up with writing excellent papers from interdisciplinary perspectives, but actually being able to convince the key players why WHO and IOE are still two different organizations in the UN. One responsible for animal health, one responsible for human health, with little interaction. I tried to bring them together to develop some technology solutions, interoperability standards. It was almost impossible. So we really have to go out there and embrace the decision makers, the policy makers, funders to make these exciting uh, revelations and research uh, answers actually a reality in in the real world so as we are as as the race of humankind generally prepared for the next pandemics thank you very much so we've heard a wide range of um, <laughs> perspectives here on um, one health uh, in the concept of global warming and and I think what's come across to me is it is that I think we're all on the same page about the importance of this and the, the complexity of this in terms of how it, how it, it, it is a major threat uh, and potentially an increasing threat, um, particularly for the emergence of zoonoses, but also a wide range of other um, health issues. But I think we've also come across huge amounts of challenge 
um, here in terms of um, largely due to the sort of siloed nature of um, people's ways of working, um, but but also uh, in in terms of once you start to move beyond theory into the real world um, to change things, how can we bridge those gaps? And so um, I, I thought I'd just start the ball rolling uh, and then open it up to uh, you for questions. But just as a, as a here's a, perhaps a provocative first question. Uh, I remember when I first um, started working in respiratory disease epidemiology and my um, consultant John Watson at, um, at the um, Health Protection Agency then was saying that the most foolish thing you can ever try to do is predict what the next pandemic is going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> was he right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might be slightly foolish, but it's not impossible. But so I, it, it always strikes me that it, we always get the pandemic that we don't expect. So how do we move? <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, well, I, the, I think Andrew the, and maybe I... Maybe you were expecting yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> Andrew and I would, would tell you that there were the three papers at least published about uh, a SARS-like virus in Wuhan that had the potential for spilling over. So the question to me is, why are we so surprised when this happens? Because you can kind of predict, you know what the spillover, the drivers are, which is anthropogenic change in the landscape, climate change, changing the, um, the transmission pathways between wildlife and humans. We know what those are, and yet we do nothing. We keep transforming our landscapes. We keep increasing the temperature and the rainfall and precipitation. So why, why are you so shocked that this happened? That we, we're not. No. Andrew's, we're not at all shocked. Predicted it 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. in that region. But mm. you could presumably also predict 20 other different things that might emerge. Well, I, th I think you, you have a good point in that we always tend to think that the next pandemic or the next big zoonotic epidemic is going to be somewhere over there, um, probably in a tropical country uh, far away from here. And that's probably going to be the case, but it's not inevitably going to be the case. I mean, we, are, we know so little about the, uh, the, 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 the natural um, pathogens of wildlife globally, and we're constantly finding new things. Even in this country, we, we have very limited uh, surveillance or knowledge of what exists in wildlife in this country for the little bit of depauperate wildlife that we've got left in this country. And, and we're still finding things like, you know, it was only, it was very recently we found we've got an endemic hantavirus in the UK. You know? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, if you'd said that to, to um, public health officials uh, b beforehand, they would have uh, completely said no, there's absolutely no way that that's in, the, in this country. Mm. So, and it's the, Kate's right, it's, the, it's change that's the issue. It's changing the interfaces between humans and animals or between animals and animals. And it's people that make those changes happen. You know, we've got a pandemic in amphibians at the moment. It's been raging for at least 30 years. That's wiped out almost at least 100 species. You know, not just decimated them, it's completely wiped them off the face of the earth. Uh, and that's because of humans moving amphibian pathogens around the world and leading to the emergence of almost like a Frankenstein pathogen where hybridization had, had, had occurred between pathogens. And, you know, I, 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 I can perfectly understand why people think that the thing we need to go and do now is to go and find out what pathogens are out there in, out there in the wild. And, you know, you've got the, um, the, 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 sort of the, the, the global vi virome project and, and so on. But personally, I think they're a bit misguided because for, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is you can, you can sequence the hell out of tissues from an animal 
and you still won't find everything that's infecting that animal. And if you think about it, um, pathogens that have co-evolved with their host over millennia, particularly viruses, but other pathogens as well, will often be present in those animals in exquisitely low numbers most of the time. Yes, they will sometimes break out and cause viremias and disease and outbreaks and so on, but most of the time they're there in such tiny numbers that we don't have the technology to, to find them reliably. So we will miss lots and lots of stuff, even if we sequence the hell out of stuff. Um, but, but pathogens change over time. Omicron, which is now the main, um, the main SARS-CoV-2 virus, if we can still call it SARS-CoV-2, is completely different to the virus that first emerged in 2020. Mm. You know, it's got different tropism, it's got d different um, transmission uh, um, me methods, so on. It's just, a, it's a different virus. Yeah. So, th think, you know, things change. Um, and we can't necessarily predict everything. But what we should be doing is instead of trying to, to do what, you know, to react to things and to find things, react to them, we should be preventing these things from happening in the first place. And there are very simple ways of doing that. You know, we prevent people from getting food poisoning whenever they eat stuff without having to know everything that's in that food. You know, there are, there are control measures that can be taken which will stop bad things happening without having to know everything about what that bad thing is. Largely con conservation related. It's not just conservation related, it's, it's basically, the, the problem is, People don't put the time and the money into this because it's very difficult to say that you've spent a million dollars and nothing's happened. Yeah. Yep. It's much easier to wait for something to happen and spend a billion dollars and say, look, we've saved people from, from, get, from dying because we've produced vaccines and so on. Uh, so politically, it's very difficult to stop something from happening because you can't prove that what you've spent the money on has actually stopped it. Mm. And I think that's the crux <laughs> the, the eternal of, problem of, of public health. Public health. I was just going to say it's the crux of the issue of public health in the future, as it has been in the past. Thank you. That was really informative. So can I, uh, is there anybody who'd like to uh, keep the conversation going with this uh, lovely panel uh, with their different perspectives? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any any thoughts? Otherwise, I can. Uh, oh yes, great. I have a question. I'm sorry for interrupting. Thank you very much, um, Gianluca from my Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction. Uh, I have a question for all of you for reflecting. Uh, what do you think are the lessons learned from the pandemic, from COVID, can, that can be replied or applied to other global health emergencies. So for example, we are dealing right now with different things can get uh, extreme, uh, not just in terms of pathogens, in terms of technological failures and uh, other stressors that can impact the healthcare system. Did you thought about it? Uh, this can be our next challenge. What are your thoughts? Right, so any volunteers to start with that one? <laughs> um, thanks very much for your question. Um, there were a few things which I drew from this pandemic. Um, I think the growing realisation of the public health community that it's bigger than just public health, it's planetary health. But also I think the ecologists realising that they've been talking to themselves for, an, for a lot of too much time and that they need to be talking to there needs to be more connection between between different disciplines. But I also think that a lot of this could have been um, mitigated if we'd had more investment in healthcare provision in countries. So we had less inequality in terms of 
access to healthcare. So universal healthcare, universal health provision. Coming from an ecologist, that's a bit weird thing to say, but I think that could have that could have ha if we'd had more investment in that, that would have reduced our vulnerability. And actually, that was one of the biggest problems I think of this pandemic. And reducing vulnerability can apply across the board. So reducing vulnerability to climate change, for example, it can also help. You know, it, I think at putting more money into that would have been. Good. <laughs> that would have been would have been a, a, a preventative way, and I don't see how that could be bad. And and I guess related to that, the 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 massive global inequalities in vaccine distribution, um, um, uh, just and 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 the the whole influence of social inequalities on the pandemic, I thought was was something that we should have been prepared for, but 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 weren't really. The other thing, of course. Technological solutions, digital technological solutions were tried quite a lot. Do, do you think we had much learning from that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was uh, writing down some some ideas here. It says that maybe one of the lessons I think we learned is that it's really hard, even if the technology is right or it's... Uh, it's important or useful, maybe it's really hard to make people believe it, right? So uh, we probably have to, to, to find or devise new ways of being convincing in terms of uh, how you change habits, uh, maybe with the help with technology. And the target is, uh, right now, is social networks. This is, this is one of the, uh, probably a, a potential solution to a lot of problems which became a very important and difficult problem in, in terms of how society deals with information and how it uh, reaches the people in different places, different cultures. Um, and the business model today is, is it's pretty bad in terms of uh, the incentives for doing this. Mm -hmm. are, are, uh, and they are driving the technology advance, the evolution in terms of funding, for example. Uh, there are so probably most of the important research problems in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, things that the technology is advancing or evolving are coming from these companies, from these social networks companies. And there's a, yeah, I think the, the, the whole sort of spread of information and misinformation. Misinformation is, is especially, and make people uh, actually uh, sort out which is important from what is fake and what is uh, actually uh, uh, bad for, uh, for them. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's really hard for us to to uh, to figure out how, what's the best way of doing it. So, and clearly, I mean, pandemic obviously transformed cities. Um, and reflections on urbanization. Yeah, no, I, 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 that question is a very interesting one, and I, I we're still reflecting on it. There are several panels, and in, in my field, which seek to to move forward, but. Um, I think the lockdowns were criminal, to be honest, uh, for the poor, uh, uh, particularly for the poor. I mean, there was an assumption that, you know, countries in low-income or middle-income countries could just copy what was being done in the rich countries uh, without thinking of the consequences. I mean, I've, I still use, I quoted earlier today, and several of you were not here, but quoted the figure that has shocked me more. London is one of the cities where there is the largest proportion of people who can work digitally, can work from home. The largest figure I've found of people who can work digitally from home is 43% of the labor force, which means 57% have to physically go there, including surgeons, of course, and dentists, but also you know, the people who clean the streets, people who clean the toilets, the drivers, and so on. And, and uh, somehow governments, and particularly local governments, that seem to assume that that was the case everywhere, right? Uh, three things we were told not to do, which was sort of, or to do, keep distance, wash your hands, uh, and I've forgotten what the third one was. But you know, 
uh, so wash your hands with plenty of water, keep a distance, and work from home. Those were the three things, right? I mean, tell me how many, what proportion of people living in informal settlements in any city in the global south would have been able to do that? None. You know, they can't work from home unless they're cooking for others, but, you know, they've got to sell the stuff. And they can't keep distance because these are where the higher densities are. And there's no running water in many of these places. So, again, I think some sort of reflection on, on what these public health messages might be and how to manage, particularly in case of respiratory diseases when you have to keep um, distances and so on. So um, there's a reflection. And not to mention transport, which is an area that I've worked on and which was actually criminal too because we didn't understand, you know, with the transmission of the virus, so the issue of surfaces and all that stuff. Uh, and, and, of course, that has ramifications for municipal budgets because a lot of public transport systems, if you exclude the informal sector, uh, are um, direct, uh, feed directly into the budget of municipalities. And we can see it in London. I remember one figure when I was writing something last year, I, I came across a piece of, in The Guardian that said that <coughs> The London Underground had lost a hundred million pounds just in advertising alone. Uh, <laughs> that was in the first six months, uh, and and you know not let alone the, the fares. Even London Underground hasn't recovered fully, so you know they keep losing money. Think of a medium-sized city or, or any city, and that's a that's a huge drainage on on public um, public budgets too. That's really interesting, and it's certainly a. a agree that it's got to be tailored to the resources and the, the setup of the country. You just can't have this sort of blanket public health response that's one size fits all. Um, you can certainly do more harm than good that way. Um, um, and I, I might as well, this is a good line of conversation. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, do you have thoughts from a zoological perspective? Um, I, I, well, I would agree with Kate that um, you know, we should. I, we'd probably learned that we'd been talking to each other too much, and we haven't <laughs> broken into the policy arena enough. I mean, we really yep. need to engage policy much more, and that's one of the reasons I, um, when I was uh, invited to, I joined this One Health High Level Expert Panel, which is an advisory panel to um, the World Health Organization. The World Organization for Animal Health, as it's now is, um, uh, United Nations Environment Programme, and the Food and Agricultural Organization, United Nations. So, I mean, they've realized that things haven't been right, and so they've come together to, to, to see what could, have, what could be done. And, and so, but, but even, even so, I mean, it sounds, it sounds grand, a One Health high level, expert panel and to the United Nations bodies, but, but how much notice will be taken of it, I think, remains to be seen. Um, you know, we, it's, you, you could just despair, <laughs> I think, because so many people, so many people know what the evidence says. <laughs> And, 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 and if we're talking about climate change and we're talking about public health, I mean, the biggest thing that we can do is, is to massively reduce, if not stop, eating meat. I mean, 83% of farmland is used to farm meat, either directly or to grow the food to feed the animals. And yet, only 18% of our protein comes from that. Much, much better use of the land would be to just grow plant food for, for people. I don't think there's a single human being on this planet who has to eat meat. Um, and yet we know meat is a massive producer of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, it's a massive use of uh, water extraction, uh, of all sorts of pollution and so on. Um, but it's also a public health issue. And it's a public health issue because of the stuff that we eat from um, from the animals, but uh, and so it causes you know cardiovascular disease and cancers and so on. But also, it's been estimated or it's been it's been calculated that if we if if if, if the extremely I get I get it unlikely um, 
a, a, um, occurrence that everybody on the planet became vegan, 75% of farmland would be freed up to go back to nature. And rewilding is one of the nature-based solutions to prevent pandemics and zoonotic disease emergence. 75% of farmland is an area the size of the United States, the EU and the UK, Australia and, Can uh, and uh, China combined. That's massive. That's land that we are using, that we are putting under land use change, that we don't actually have to. We want to, and I can understand that, but we don't have to. I I think the world would be an infinitely better place if we listened to you. <laughs> um, Patty. Well, thank you for the question, John Luca. I think that's, that's great to think about what we can learn. I think going, looking back at March 2020, at the beginning of the lockdown, I'm sure all of you remember all these fantastic IT ideas that we're going to develop this great COVID pricing app which, where we can trace people moving around and making, giving warnings to people to stay apart and stay away where the virus is being transmitted. <laughs> Even WHO jump on this wagon and they initially agreed to team up with a university in Australia and a US company to develop this COVID, I can't remember the name, there's some fancy name as WHO like, um, COVID app which will stop the COVID basically. I think we learned a technology can help, but it's not a silver bullet. And the issue, of, the issue of interoperability and national needs and local needs in low-income countries, trust, is just enormous. And this has been completely ignored at the beginning when lots of money, look at the UK, that a billion invested in this untraced app, which people didn't believe they had to use. They didn't believe the government, which <laughs> wasn't actually implementing the policy provided and advised by the experts. So I think the matter of trust, both in politicians and in IT technology, has to, has to be there. And we got into the society where unfortunately, you know, the three biggest players, and most of us are from Brazil, UK or US in this room, you know, had politicians in the middle of the pandemics who were absolutely the wrong people for the wrong time. We had Trump, Bolsonaro and Johnson needlessly killing people's lives by misinformation, by not listening to the right people, by not implementing the right policies. So I think we really have to step back and look at can we prevent the situation both from the zoonotics idea, better public health investments, local public health, which we have ignored in this country, but also how do we prevent to be in a situation where we have such a disconnect between the leadership and what the crisis actually need? And it's a question maybe beyond this panel, but I think that's the, that's the ultimate well, question. No, I mean, because I then the funding will go to the right place, then the policy will be changed. You know, this is, it all needs to be connected. But I think that's where, at the, you know, because we're talking about such massive global problems and uh, such massive global coordinated responses that are needed, then ultimately it can't work unless we engage our political leaders uh, in this as well as we're, you know, belatedly beginning to see <laughs> with climate change, but obviously not fast enough. And so I'm, I'm interested in perspectives on how we can, you know, how we can influence more um, outside of our uh, immediate scientific circles. <laughs> Small question. Oh, gosh, I wish, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, yeah. I mean, it 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 does make you despair, doesn't it? Because I mean, we know we know we know about fossil fuels and climate change, and we've known about that for a long, long time. It's taken until you know the pips are squeaking before things are actually being well, before we are actually being told by the politicians that they're going to do things, and then it just needs. It just needs a slight change in the geopolitical situation for it to all fall apart again. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult to sit on a panel like this and not 
and not be rather doomy and gloomy. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, our Prime Minister says we shouldn't be doomsters and gloomsters. But, yeah, can you be an optimist? Well, maybe you and I can, can tag team that. But I, I, I have seen, you know, I've been, you know, Andrew and I have been banging on about uh, biodiversity decline and populations and climate change for, you know, 30, 30 years, I yeah. know, so. Um, but what I've seen change uh, is public opinion. And you're on this panel, you're chairing this panel, you're a medic. You know, you're a medic, you're chair. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's a change. That is a definite change. You have uh, young voices standing up and saying this isn't good enough. Thank and you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt Gretton. But um, you have... A seat, uh, you have a change, there is a change, and you know, I, I was uh, I went to a kind of uh, pre pandemic, I went to one of those climate change protests outside Houses of Parliament. Greta was there, and it was, I was really emotional for me because I've been going on about this for ages, nobody was listening. Uh, but then, incremental change, change happens non-linearly I think because you go on about it for ages and then there's a tipping point there's a documentary or there's somebody that rises up and says something and then it ch it, ch it can change overnight mm. and I think but you have to have that groundswell of information and at some point it tips and it has tipped and I think how do we get politicians to listen we have to get the public to care and then the politicians will listen because it's votes it's about votes so I, I think it's about public, tipping public opinion into understanding what's going on and it being part of that story, part of what everyone knows. It is about climate change or biodiversity loss. That's why we're in this pro these problems. <laughs> yes, maybe I'll qualify my optimism a little bit. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that, I mean, if you look at the trajectory of the rich countries, you know, we, the, there's a there's a size of a middle class with a high um, degree of consumption, which we now can afford to say, well, you know, I'm not going to consume anymore. But when you've got countries that are growing and have aspirations uh, and uh, urbanizing, like China and India, and um, mm -hmm. you know, wait for Uganda to urbanize. You know, Uganda has a, a, a population pyramid which is like this, which means there are masses of kids waiting to become adults who are hoping to a get a job and b consume so i mean and, and nigeria is going to be enormous as well in sort of 30 40 years time so i mean I, I, my hope is that cities will help in some way because you will channel that uh, energy and that sort of mass of population into cities the issue is actually not going on paths with which you know the rich world has gone through which is high meat consumption and high energy consumption but find ways in which you know we can we can sort of use um, renewable energies, uh, reduce our consumption of, of meat, and so on. Um, but you know that has to take its course. I don't think you can say to China with any with a with a sort of straight face, or to the India, you know, we've gone through that. Look at our lifestyle, but you're not allowed to do it. Exactly. And that is where the problems come. That's where you know all the. The, the COP twenty, the COP successive COPs fall apart because you know there's this arrogance that we can say to to these countries that you know we've had it, you know you can't have it, and where I despair is in the U.S. Uh, and 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 the fact that it's a largely suburban um, uh, setup where you inevitably inevitably need individual forms of, of transport. And, uh, and yes, all this rubbish about you know, electric cars is going to save the world. Rubbish, they won't. You need to massively mine huge amounts of minerals to produce this new sort of round of, of cars. And then you have to dispose of the old ones, which of course is hugely polluting, um, and, and dispose of the batteries afterwards. And that mining, we know, causes enormous uh, local and planetary changes. And then there's the issue of localized, and it's more and more emerging things, which probably Andrew has, uh, has no more than anybody else here, which is that, you know, the pollution, they say, well, they're not polluting. Of course they're polluting. They're polluting in the process of, of production. They're polluting in the process of using them. The, the pollution that comes out of, of the rubber tires is local, but it's 
it's really bad. I mean, it's now proven to affect um, people's lungs. So, I mean, that's a destruction which actually nobody has really fought against really seriously. They think this is what's going to save the world. So that's where I, I despair a little bit, is that, you know, we're emulating the U.S. style and becoming suburban. You know, a lot of Latin America has become a suburban. And that's where I get really worried. And there's something to do around that and say, no, hang on, let's keep it compact. Let's use public transport. Let's not individualize forms of transport. So cities are actually quite a good thing. I, well, you know, we have, I think they're, they're better than nothing than anything else. Yeah. I mean, the populations will continue growing. Yeah. We have to fit people somewhere. Let's fit them in, in places where the, the, the ecological footprints are, are lower, mm -hmm. ideally, than, you know, dispersed suburban areas. Or, you know, That's sure. very interesting. I, sure. I think, Patty, we probably need to be... I don't know how long you want to, the session to well, last. Half past seven. Until half past, okay, so we've got a, a little bit more time. <laughs> optimist or pessimist? <laughs> well, actually, I agree with, with Kate. I'm a bit optim optimist in terms of, uh, despite maybe 20% of the, for example, Brazilian population who believes that the vaccine is uh, Chinese con conspiracy <laughs> for, uh, you know, controlling our minds and, and bodies, 80% of the population got vaccinated. And they are really, uh, they, they, uh, they speak about it and they uh, have an uh, important message to the politicians. Uh, even though this 20% that I mentioned are getting informed by the social networks and groups and the bubbles that we know that they are, they are almost impossible to, to, uh, to finish or to, to invade. But uh, probably this 80% that are worried about this and this changes the lives of everybody. So I think that uh, at least for some habits are going to be changed after this. And I think it's, this is uh, permanent. Uh, uh, a lot of people will be uh, more conscious about their uh, their uh, health care or uh, uh, going to the politicians and, and uh, ask for uh, better services in terms of uh, uh, at least avoiding these uh, the terrible effects it had in the lives of everybody. So uh, I think the public opinion has changed. Uh, maybe not enough for uh, maybe avoiding the worst effects of the next pandemic, but at least we, we probably will not be so uh, anxious and do s s all the stupid things we, we, we have done <laughs> in the beginning. So uh, maybe uh, there will be uh, uh, the next pandemic maybe will uh, last uh, l l a short, shorter time. <laughs> you are an optimist. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe because of the the, the uh, because in the uh, it was really really uh, uh, anomalous, like for for the lives of everybody, it affected everybody. So it's something that uh, maybe uh, it didn't happen. Uh, it hadn't happened uh, before, at least in. Uh, I don't know, a hundred years. So mm -hmm. this is something that we have to we have to consider. I think we've got so, someone in the audience was. Do you have a question? Did you have? I have a question about. Wait, 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 wait for the microphone. <laughs> Um, my question is, we focused a lot on sort of urban areas. I, I was wondering, are we overlooking rural areas in LMICs in terms of sort of, you know, disease surveillance and emerging disease threats? Uh, Andrew, do you want to start with that? Um, yeah, I, 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 I could answer a little bit to that. Um, I've, um, I've done some work on uh, disease surveillance and um, syndromic surveillance of human health in, in West Africa. And, and you would need quite a, a large uh, outbreak before anybody picked it up. 
and it would then, by the time it was picked up, it would be too late. Um, the, 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 the systems currently don't work. Um, and one thing that I'm particularly concerned about, uh, Kate talked about having, uh, about the inequalities in health provision and so on. Almost, almost as bad as that is that um, where you put in some health provision, but, but it's not good enough. Uh, so you get peop you get, you bring sick people to a hospital, to a central area, to, to uh, an urban area, but the, the facilities, the diagnostics, the treatments aren't there. That's a very good way to encourage the spread of, of, of an outbreak and to make sure that an outbreak that may have been very small and contained within a rural area, a village or something, becomes a national outbreak um, or even an international outbreak. So we have to be cognizant of that and that needs to be addressed. And the way to address that is to put an awful lot more resourcing into the provision of primary health care in uh, rural settings in the global south. I mean, I think that there ha have been uh, lots of some good news in terms of Nigeria, you know, that they've put in a, a really amazing surveillance system. Uh, of course, it could do still with some more money and support, but, you know, they, they've been, um, you know, the, I work on Lassa fever in Nigeria, and, like, having those those reports and the, the, the systems there that, that, that are working has, is a game changer for understanding how to control Lassa fever. So I, I think, it, you know, when, it, when it's working, it actually works really well. So I think it is a, is a good flagship for how you can improve surveillance and then interventions. Excellent. So I think we'll probably wrap up um, now. Uh, thank you for a, a really lively discussion. I think um, what's come home to me about this is that, uh, as always in public health issues, prevention is so much better than cure. Pre prevention and early detection uh, is, is where we need to be at. If you're um, responding to a, a large-scale pandemic, it's kind of too late. Um, and, and, and I think the One Health agenda has a huge amount to add to that prevention agenda. Um, so, um, Patty, do you want to just say a last word or two? to close. So I would just say, I think it's been a great opportunity to hear all of these voices. Maybe coming from the technical perspective to bring it back to the digital agenda for One Health. I think we need the same kind of revolutions in public understanding and public awareness we are now going through regarding the climate change. People need to understand the implications of digital divide. We can't be part of our population because everything is going online. And at the same time, we have really need to invest into understanding how to distinguish between credibility of sources and fake news. We also can't be blindfolded by our governments using emergency as an excuse to allow IT companies to creep into the public health and healthcare sector, which is normally and has to be publicly owned and publicly funded. And this happened in the UK with regards to several IT companies from the US. So I think making sure we raise the awareness like Greta does for global warming, to better understand the dangers with data being shared with inappropriate third-party commercial players and making sure we actually invest in the opportunities for technologists to improve One Health for All. I think that's our next task. Thank you, everybody. Uh, a round of applause for our panel. Time for a drink. Yeah. So, before we, so I would like to thank you to the panel and I have a few final words. So thank you very much for... <laughs> so thank you very much to the panel and I have five, five, five final words. So thank you so much for staying until the very end. So before the drinks, I have, would like to invite a um, couple of people who have been instrumental in making today's happen and we have little resource and most of them, except one, are students. So I would like to invite Lan, who's been great in 
helping with the event, doing all the comms. Aisha has been great in organizing the logistics, the IT side of it, and all the travel for our Brazilian and Turkish colleagues. Would you mind coming to the front? <laughs> and, I would, and I would like to invite, and I would like, I'd like to invite Lisa, who although she's our new lecturer who only joined us about a month ago, she's been great in getting our fantastic report together and learning about what we do and chasing around printers last minute, so we got the report <laughs> on just on time. And finally, obviously, Sarah, our IADR events manager and co coordinator, who's been great with dealing with all last minute emergencies, <laughs> as they always are, but everything at the end very well. So thank you to Sarah, Lan, Aisha, and Lisa. Whoa. Whoa.